In the opening scene, we see a young boy running away, and the protagonist of this story is basically me, because he thought to himself how tired of everything he actually was. He was tired of doing quests that were only good for the higher-ups, and he was tired of being forced to take quests which he didn't like. Oh, he's talking about this kind of tired, never mind then. But he had made up his mind that he won't do it anymore. But let's see what led to this state of his and what was the last chore that made him want to change his situation. So the day before was the only day that he didn't go to work and the reason for that was that he slept in and woke up a lot later than usual. Okay, now I'm the protagonist again, I guess. <laughs> so the boy was so tired that he fell asleep on the floor just in front of his doorstep. It seemed like he was defeated and thinking about everything made him exhausted. He couldn't stop himself from crying as he thought about everything and even if he wanted to, it was too late for him to make it to the meeting, but the boy didn't particularly care about that as he had no intentions of going anyways. So the boy decided to go out for a walk and he took his staff and left his house. He thought to himself how he already felt better even though he slept poorly the night before, but even that was enough for him. The other thing that was going through his mind was that he was about to be shouted at yet again and that made him not wanna go. So he walked all the way to the adventurer's guild and when he entered, he was greeted by a lovely receptionist. We find out that his name was Aix. A-I-X, A-X, <laughs> and the receptionist wished him good luck, but before he went on his quest, the guildmaster wanted to speak to him and A-X realized he was about to be yelled at. The guildmaster looked really angry and was acting like a jerk. He first insulted A-X and said how he was a weak mage, incapable of using even the simplest of spells, and he demanded to know why A-X didn't show up yesterday without permission. But it seemed that he was even more pissed because A-X didn't come to the meeting that he called. Aix explained that those meetings were always called at the start of each month and nothing interested him during those meetings as they consisted only of a briefing from the guild master. However, there were some adventurers that found them interesting and for some reason they would be motivated afterwards. Aix didn't feel like explaining anything and he just apologized and bowed his head. The guild master explained that he had a role of supporting other members with spells that would buff their stats, but as he wasn't there, Miss Aerith took on his task and the guildmaster told Aix to thank her when he saw her. The guildmaster went on to say how he did a lot of work to make all the adventurers happy and satisfied and Aix just stood there and nodded his head to everything the guildmaster had to say. The guildmaster extended his hand to Aix and he held his mage accreditation which had all the information about Aix on it. Aix was an E-rank mage and he was 19 years old and he was known as the Defect Mage or Defect. Is it Defect or Defect? Defect Mage. He was known as the Defect Mage in the guild. But instead of giving Aix his card, the guildmaster had other thoughts and he snapped the card in two right in front of Aix's face. He told Aix that that was his punishment and that he would have to start again from the lowest F rank. Aix looked at the blank card and he thought how pointless it was to have him start over because he wasn't even anywhere high on the ladder to begin with. Aix took some time to think about it and if he spilled a drop of his blood onto the card, he would once again register himself into the guild, but it seemed that he was hesitating. While he stood there thinking, the guildmaster rushed him to finish signing the contract contract by spilling his blood, but his words didn't seem to affect Aix at all. Aix clenched his fist, gripped his staff as tightly as he could, and that was the turning point in his life. He bowed down and said that he thought that he wasn't really cut out to be an adventurer, and he thanked the guildmaster for everything up until then. The guildmaster was shocked with that, and he tried to make Aix rethink his decision. It was Aix's first time to see the guildmaster with such a look on his face, but he couldn't care less about him and what the guildmaster thought. A clanking sound was was heard and Aix turned around to see Patis, who was the leader of the strongest clan called the Zombies, and Patis was happy to hear that Aix was giving up and quitting the guild. He didn't think highly of Aix anyways, and he was happy that they wouldn't be fellow adventurers anymore, and he did feel kinda ashamed to be called a teammate with a guy who couldn't use novice magic properly. Aix didn't say anything to him, and he just turned his back and started walking away, but the receptionist called out to him. She said that there were already some quests that he had taken 
taken and that it would be good if he finished them, but Aix turned to her and coldly said, I quit. <laughs> the receptionist was on the verge of crying her eyes out, but Aix felt no sentiment towards her as he had cried himself to sleep the night before and he even woke up crying. But this continued to insult Aix by saying how he was just a weak mage and the fact that he had some quest offers wasn't a reason for celebration because he couldn't even use simple magic. Aix wasn't moved by his insults at all because no one seemed to understand the position he was in right now. It was true that those personal quests had 50% better rewards, but as he was just an E rank mage, that wasn't the case. Aix was just about to leave, but the receptionist begged him to do that quest even if he did it only for the forest guards and the lord of the feud and the former guildmaster as well. Aix didn't have the strength to debate with her, so he decided to take up the quest and the receptionist asked him to read all the contents and the prize out loud. The receptionist explained how the quest contained three different tasks. The task from the feudal lord was fixing his maid's magical tool. The task from the forest guards was aiding them in patrolling the forest and exterminating potential monsters and the last task was from the former guildmaster who required maintenance and management of a tavern for a full month. That being said, the receptionist added that the price for completing the full quest was 7 silver coins and when she said that, silence crept into the guild's lobby. But this made fun of Aeg's reward and he said that if he had been offered such a reward, that would be an insult to him as that was the price of his lunch basically. But the thing with those personal quests was that the mage had to take them even though they might be humiliating. Aix also realized that the reward was completely insignificant, even though he was an E rank mage, it was still an absurdly small amount of money. But Aix did decide to do that one final quest and he exited the guild. The first request was to fix the magic tool of the feudal lord's maid and Aix went to their property, simply uttered Ice Bowl, created the magic tool and put it in its place and with that he finished the first request with ease. His magic would last for a month at least and the cold room was ready for use. The next thing Aix needed to do was to place light balls so they would illuminate the whole place. Because the place was so big and Aix had other business to attend to, he didn't want to waste his time and energy going around and placing light balls everywhere. And when he thought about what the Viscount told him, it would be best if they could have him place some portable ice and wind balls. Aix thought about that for a moment and he had an idea. He thought that he could use a tube from a discarded scroll and insert the balls inside, thus making them portable. He did so and it worked perfectly, the wind was so refreshing and what he created was basically a portable AC. But even though Aix was satisfied that he figured out a solution to their problem, he felt something weighing him down. And his gut feeling was right all along. Redley the Viscount came and saw his invention. He liked it very much and he ordered Aix to make him a hundred of such fans by tomorrow. But Aix had already gotten the Viscount's signature that his job was finished and because the Viscount was only looking to use him, Aix refused to take up his new order. The Viscount was angry to hear Aix disobey him, but nothing mattered to Aix anymore. He made up his mind and he didn't want to spend his entire life lying to him. He told the Viscount off and said that even after he served him for 5 years, he still kept coming to him with outrageous tasks and if Aix wanted to complete them in the given time, he would have to give up on his sleep entirely. But Aix didn't want that and he reassured the Viscount that his decision was final. The Viscount was enraged by the fact that Aix, who was just a commoner, talked back to him who was a noble. The Viscount was such a man that he was ready to have Aix executed just for a minor inconvenience, but he tried to portray himself as a generous and kind lord, so he tried giving Aix a chance to apologize. And as the Viscount waited for Aix's response, he had a slimy look on his face because he thought that he had won Aix over by his threat, but he was surprised by Aix's words. Aix was dead serious and he said that he didn't want to work anymore at all. The Viscount was completely shocked and Aix just lowered his gaze. The reason why Aix lowered his gaze was that that was the first time he spoke his true feelings. 
He was happy, he said how he really felt, but at the same time it was hard and he was happy it was over. The Viscount took a step back and he looked troubled by what Aix just said and it seemed like he was going through his pockets in search of something. Aix saw that the Viscount's face was completely different and he thought that he had some health issues, so he asked him whether everything was alright. Instead of an answer, Aix was bombarded with a series of insults from the Viscount. He said how he always knew that Aix was a bad mage and that he would do something about Aix's attitude now. He even said that he now wanted 200 of those fans and added that he would put out a request at the guild so that Aix wouldn't be able to turn him down. But Aix wasn't affected by that, he calmly told the Viscount that he could kindly pass the request on to someone else as he had already finished his business with the guild. Our protagonist got what he needed from the Viscount and that was his signature that he had completed his request. Our protagonist again told the Viscount to write out the personal request to the guild but that he won't be the one taking it. With that being said, Aix left the Viscount and he went on to his second task and that was patrolling the forest together with the forest guards. Aix was tired because all the personal requests that were directed at him seemed like they were only exploiting him and that seemed to be the case with the task from the forest guards as well. They were nowhere to be seen which only meant that they weren't doing their job at all and they wanted someone else to do it instead of them and in that case that someone was our protagonist. Aix looked back on the five years he spent in the guild and it seemed that all of his requests and quests were exactly the same no matter what type of a quest it was, be it killing monsters or gathering magic stones or doing everything on his own. Everything felt like he was constantly doing extra work, way more than what was already asked of him. And while Aix was immersed in his thoughts, he sensed something behind him and once he turned around he saw an orc king and it seemed that the orc king noticed him as well. However, Aix was quick and he fired off his fireball spell but the whole scene was anticlimactic. Just a a tiny flame flew out from Aik's staff and even the orc king was disappointed. The flame did connect with the orc's face but he didn't seem to be bothered with it at all because it was so small basically and not powerful. However, Aix was satisfied with his spell because there was something special about his magic and that was that his flames couldn't possibly be put out and the flames on the orc's face extended and very soon the flames had turned into a bigger fire and that was the end of the orc king. Aix realized that he had gotten stronger in the past five years but something moved quickly behind him and before he even knew it, a shadow wolf had bitten his leg now. He tried to shake it off but the wolf wouldn't let go so Aix had to use his stun spell to zap the wolf and only then did the wolf back off. Aix was hurt and his leg was injured but the wolf luckily ran away. However, as Aix's magic was everlasting, the wolf continued getting zapped until it died. The night was long and Aix spent the whole night patrolling the forest and killing the monsters. When he came to turn in his requests, his stomach hurt from all the mana potion he drank to replenish what he used to cast his spells. His final report said that he killed one orc king, 15 orcs, 8 shadow wolves and 2 goblins and to do that he had to use 1 recovery potions and 7 mana potions. But as there was no one to sign his documents as the guards weren't doing their jobs, his quest was immediately considered completed. Aix took one last look at the empty building and he was grateful for the last 5 years. Aix was a bit concerned about the number of monsters in the forest and it was way smaller than when he initially started out as an adventurer. He wondered what or who it was that was killing them. But as he was tired he could only think of how he wanted to sleep on a comfy bed. Our protagonist slowly went back to his house and he crawled into his bed. He was dead tired but something was bugging him. He wondered what would he do with his pants that got torn from the wolf bite from earlier. When he got up he tried to stitch them with a lucky needle that he got from a guy named Luke but because he was terrible at stitching clothes he could feel it going terribly wrong. His fears came true and he in indeed did mess up stitching the pants so what he ended up doing was cutting the torn part and he was left with shorts instead of pants. But 
there was no use worrying about it because he would buy himself a new pair of pants once he completed the quest. Aix put on his cloak and as he was running late he needed to hurry. His last quest was to run and manage a tavern for a month and it was requested by his former guild master. As soon as our protagonist entered the tavern, he was struck by a cup that flew straight onto his head. The former guild master was angry that he didn't check in before the tavern opened its doors to customers. He was a bold older man and Aix knew that he loved to practice his former authority. It was obvious that Aix would have a lot of work in that tavern and he immediately got to work. He had to use a couple of spells to get the place going so he used his house cleaning spell which summoned a small fairy that cleaned everything. He used his ice ball spell in the storage room to keep everything cool and fresh. Aix used his fireball to light the fire so the food could be cooked and the water ball spell to fill up the buckets with the water. Our protagonist finished everything and he thought to himself that his spells would last for a whole month so that would mean that his job there was finished as well basically. But he was exhausted because he used a lot of his spells and it took him a while to get everything settled. The former guild master made fun of him for getting exhausted from novice magic spells and he also told our protagonist that because he was late he wouldn't punish him in any way but he wouldn't sign his commitment mission as well. Aix was at first disheartened but what the guild master said next caught his attention. The guild master told him that that would mean that he had failed to complete his quest to the fullest and Aix had never been happier in his life. He told his former guild master that he would be completely fine with that and the bold man looked at him with a dose of curiosity. However, our protagonist was really happy and he walked down to the adventurers guild having failed to complete one quest out of all three. He was happy because that was the first time in his five years at the guild that something like that happened and on top of that it happened on the day that he was quitting the guild. I still don't understand why he's happy about it. Anyways, well, let's find out. Aix entered the guild and in his hands there were three request forms from the quest that he had been finishing. The receptionist took them, inspected them and when she finished, she told Aix that everything was okay and she thanked him. Aix thanked her as well for her service in the past five years and he waved her goodbye. As he did that, he felt released and he felt like the chains that kept him constricted and tied to one place had been broken and for the first time in his life, he felt a sensation of freedom. My bro is about to become an Eren Jäger. <laughs> Aix couldn't wait to exit the guild and start running down the street. It was finally over, five years of working for the guild, felt like he was completely enslaved with no will of his own. He thought to himself how being an adventurer was awful and never again in his life would he want to become one again. He spread out his arms to the sky and with full lungs shouted out that he was finally free. The first thing that Aix did as a free and unemployed man was getting some proper sleep. Finally, when he woke up, he went outside to stretch and while he stretched, he thought about what he could do now that he had some money and all the time in the world. The idea of freedom was wonderful to him. Aix collected all the money from his quests, but he never had the time nor energy to spend it and as he walked down the street, a delicious smell caught his attention. Our protagonist looked around and he noticed a small skewer stool and he thought that it would be a good idea if he started his unemployed period by treating himself for the very first time in his life. He went over to the skewer stool and asked for one and he wanted to see what it would be like to eat for satisfaction and not for survival. While he was enjoying his cure, the Viscount was complaining to someone about him. He said all sorts of bad things about Aix, but the main thing that pissed him off was that Aix refused to obey his orders even though he was just an E-rank mage and couldn't even use simple spells properly. It seemed that the Viscount talked to his butler and the butler had a name that fitted his character. He never said or did anything that would anger this lord and he was 
was called Yes Man. <laughs> the Viscount acted like he forgot AX's name and he asked Yes Man to remind him and he thought that he would come off as unaffected by the whole thing if he acted like that. However, he did order his butler to arrange that none of the business offer employment went to AX. The Viscount thought that that would force AX to return to him and beg him for mercy and for a job offer. Butler Yes Man understood his task and said Yes Man and he was determined to obey his master's orders. While the Viscount went on about how he needed to teach Aix a lesson, Yes Man noticed the cooling fan that Aix made and he asked his master about it. The Viscount lied that it was his idea and that Aix only put everything together and made it functional. Yes Man was a bit surprised that someone like Aix who could only do simple magic was able to come up with such an idea but he kept his thoughts to himself and he said totally different things to his master. Yesman commended the Viscount on his revolutionary vision and the Viscount said that he had five of those fans made for him. Out of his great generosity, he had decided to give one of them to Yesman so he could cool himself off while he was in the kitchen and Yesman was happy to accept such a gift. The Viscount complained how he originally wanted Aix to make 200 such fans but that he refused to obey and ran off and Yesman agreed that Aix was a fool for doing so. However, because the Viscount mentioned the kitchen, that made Yesman remember something important. It seemed that their water pot was empty and they had no other water supplies and he asked the Viscount for his opinion on that matter and for further instructions. Yesman blamed the lack of water on Aix as well and the Viscount grew even more agitated. He simply said that Yesman should find another mage from the guild that could do the same job and he could even buy a magic item that did the same thing if it wasn't too expensive. I mean, even though he is the Viscount, he was a miser after all. Yesman replied that he would take care of it and he thought to himself how anyone could have done a better job than Aix. In the meantime, our protagonist was trying out the skewer for the first time and after he took a single bite, the first bite, he immediately fell in love with the meat. Our protagonist couldn't remember the last time he ate something so good and quitting his job was what made it possible for him to try it out and he was so glad he quit. But after only one bite from the skewer, Aix was already full and even though he would love to eat a lot more, his stomach just wouldn't take in more food. It seemed that not eating properly for 5 years made his stomach adapt to eating only little. Aix was really disappointed for not being able to eat more and while he was thinking about the food, someone from behind him asked him whether or not he was going to eat the skewer. A homeless young girl with pointy ears and a tail was the one that asked him this question and she looked kinda malnourished and Aix realized that so he gave her his skewer because he wasn't going to eat it anyway. He warned her that she should try eating it slowly as it was quite possible that her stomach would act up after not having meat for some time. How does he know that this girl didn't have meat? She had meat last night. Chicken, you know? What kind of a meat did you think I was talking about? Anyways, the girl said that it had been over half a year since the last time she tasted meat. Now, now she's talking about different kind of meat. <laughs> she was really grateful to Aix for letting her have that skewer. Our protagonist thought to himself how he was an orphan and he realized that meat was a luxury for most people. While they were waving each other goodbye, Aix thought about what else could he give the little girl if he were to ever stumble upon her again. He was very happy with how his first day as being unimportant employed went and he decided that he would make the most out of it. He would live as he had always wanted until he was completely satisfied. Even though he didn't have any other things he needed to do, he felt like spending some money and that's exactly what he was about to do. He walked into a local store and took a look around. It seemed that he wasn't able to recognize the majority of the items in the shop because he hadn't been out in the last 5 years and the only times he was out was when he went to the adventure guild or when he was out finishing the quests. In the meantime the world had gone through a lot of changes and he didn't even know what was happening. He got a bit agitated because he thought that he would finally be able to spend some of his money but the longer he looked around the shop the more he found out how ignorant he actually was. He was so grossed out by that fact that he desperately looked for something that 
might be of some comfort to him and just when he thought that he would never find anything in that shop that would lessen his pain, he stumbled upon something very peculiar. His attention was caught by a slime pillow but there wasn't anything special about the pillow itself. The reason why Aix was attracted to it was the advertisement of the item and it said that the pillow felt just like Opai? Hmm? Isn't this the best ad you can ever put on any kind of a pro product? Our protagonist couldn't resist the urge to touch and see how the item felt, and as soon as he did, he was baffled. The pillow was so soft that Aix ended up putting his head into it and snuggling it like crazy. He felt so happy, and as he loved the item so much, he decided that he wasn't letting go of it. However, while Aix was enjoying the softness of this pillow, slime pillow. The lady that owned the shop saw him but she wasn't really sure whether it was really Aix or not. When Aix turned around she became happy to have guessed that it was actually him and she was surprised to see him in the shop. Our protagonist immediately tried to come up with an explanation for why he was groping and cuddling with the slime pillow but the lady said that she understood everything because he was indeed a boy after all. She continued to make Aix uncomfortable by asking him what he thought about her though as she would probably grow into a fine looking woman and Aix tried to go on with his initial story. He said that he only wanted to see whether there was any quality to that slime pillow and he added that he would buy it because he touched it with his hands. Aix knew that there was no way he would be able to lie himself out of that situation and he just dropped down his shoulders and sighed. However, the lady wasn't going to let him go that easily before she had her share of fun with him and she jokingly offered Aix to touch her Opai if he was so interested in them and our protagonist was so uncomfortable and shy that he even fell down on the floor. The lady was just joking of course but there was something that she needed Aix's help with. She sent a couple of personal requests to the guild but they weren't responding to them and no one was assigned to take them on. So she needed someone to clean her bath and to make it functional once again. Oh my god, is this turning into a hentai? Please, no, I actually find this story quite interesting and unique and if just it turns to be hentai, what the hell? Anyways, Aix thought to himself that while he was still in the guild, there was never any free time for him to take up quests from ordinary people because he was always buried under a never-ending pile of outrageous quests from the people with authority. Even though the lady was a bit bold, our protagonist thought that she wasn't asking for anything outrageous and so he decided to help her. She thanked him and said that she would send the necessary paperwork to the guild and that made Aix change his mind. Instead of wasting his time to try to explain that he couldn't take up her job because he parted ways with the guild, he apologized to the lady and simply said that he stopped being an adventurer and that he had decided that he wouldn't do hentai anymore. I mean, he didn't, he wouldn't do adventurer's work anymore, but also hentai because if he went to fix her bathtub, I guarantee this is what would happen. Now, in the meantime, at the Viscount's kitchen, the butler, yes man, was looking at the broken water bowl. The butler was annoyed as that was another thing that he would need to take care of and he asked the magician why that happened. The magician that seemed to be an A rank mage said that he used magic as he was ordered and that the bowl simply broke on its own. But Yesman responded that Aix usually put his water bowl inside of the water bowl and the bowl would have an endless source of water. The mage couldn't believe what the butler just said and he told him that there wasn't any magic that could work so well just like he described right now. Yesmin was surprised to find out that Aix's magic was really something special and now that he had experienced using such an infinite source of water, he couldn't imagine how he would live without it. Yesmin remembered how there was another water bowl that Aix had used his magic on and he would take that one to the kitchen and he would solve his problem for now that way. Just when he came up with this idea, the lights started flickering and they were going out one by one. Yesman noticed that and that only meant more work for him. It made Yesman ask himself whether Aix was the one who worked on the lights as well. It seemed that that was the beginning of Yesman's troubles. Now back in the shop, the lady tried to persuade Aix to help her with her bat and he was hesitating and refusing to work. The lady tried changing her tactics and said that she would give him the best slime pillow she had in return, but our protagonist refused that offer as well and said that he could afford one on his own. But Aix 
turned around to see the slime pillow's price and it was one large silver coin, which now didn't sound like a bad deal. He experienced a battle of good versus bad in his mind, one voice kept telling him to do the work as it would only take him around 5 minutes to complete and the other voice kept telling him how he shouldn't bother at all as he had already decided that he wouldn't work anymore. I mean, you can't not work forever, right? At some point you're gonna spend your money and then you need to earn more money right what are you gonna do then are you just gonna decide to starve yourself to death because you can't afford food but you don't want to work anymore i don't know bro my bro is kind of what's the word for somebody who doesn't have good plans so this is our protagonist he's kind of a person who doesn't have good plans then the lady said that if he refused to fix her bath she would tell everyone what she had just seen and ax knew he shouldn't let that happen she also added that the slime pillow was very popular and that people even placed orders up front and it was very hard to get a hold of it and ax realized that as well he wanted the slime pillow very much and he convinced himself that doing a favor for a friend wouldn't count as a job so he told the lady that he would help her after their all. The lady was overtaken by happiness and she offered Alex her daughter's hand in marriage. She even said that she carried another baby in her stomach. If Alex was interested in her, what is going on? So our protagonist didn't pay much attention to her as he knew that she was brazen and he thought to himself that if he helped her, they would probably be happy and he would end up getting the slime pillow for free, which would be a good thing for both sides. Our protagonist went inside the bathroom and he used a couple of his magic spells and items and in less than no time everything was finished and the bath looked like new. He told the lady that everything worked perfectly and that it would continue to work for a whole year and the lady was surprised when she heard that. Aix thought to himself that the magic could probably last even longer because doing all the unnecessary work for the nobles served him like training and his magic had probably gotten stronger in the last five years but he was determined to never go through such torture again. Again. The door opened, but Aix didn't see anyone come in, and only after he looked down did he see a little head. A young little girl walked into the shop and was very happy to see Aix there, and the lady greeted the girl and told her that our protagonist fixed the bath and that everything functioned perfectly well. The girl's name was Lina, and she was the lady's daughter, and to express her gratitude, she told Aix that she would do anything he wanted her to do, but Aix smacked her on the forehead before she could finish her sentence. Our protagonist couldn't believe that the owner lady was so irresponsible that she hadn't taught her daughter better and Aix told Lina to never say such things until she grew up. Lena was confused because she thought that she was already big and she looked down at her opai which was definitely not what Aix meant I guess. <laughs> Aix warned Lena to never do such things in public especially in front of the notorious elf teacher LZ. The lady called out to Aix and it seemed that she had an idea. She told him that now that he was unemployed she could use his magic very well and she offered him a job. As soon as Aix heard anything that was associated with work, he felt like he was getting stabbed with a sharp knife. That being said, Aix kindly refused her offer and said that his decision about not wanting to work was firm and that he wouldn't change his mind. He apologized but the lady felt obliged to apologize as well and she walked up to Aix and hugged him. She said that she would never mention work to him again and Lina also ran to join them in the group hug. Aix felt really happy and he thanked both the lady and Lina for cheering him up. Aix took his slime pillow and while he was on his way out, the lady told him that if he ever needed advice or anything like that, he could always come to her and she would gladly help him as she considered him a friend. That made Aix extremely happy and he turned around and asked the lady whether she knew anything about something called ice rooms and the lady acted like she had never ever heard about them before. Aix used his magic to conjure up an ice pool and he rolled it towards the lady and said that it was a magic tool that wouldn't melt in a year and she could use it however she liked it was hers. That was Aix's way of saying thank you to the young lady, I do the lady, not young lady, lady, her daughter is young. <laughs> the lady and her daughter Lina were amazed with his abilities and they even ended up fighting over the ice ball. In the meantime we see another girl playing in her room with her plushies. She kept asking herself one question and she wondered why someone wasn't coming to see her. 
and that someone was of course Aix, as we will soon find out. Our protagonist couldn't wait to go home and try sleeping on his new pillow. He went to bed and slept like a baby, and when he woke up, he slept some more again. He couldn't remember the last time he slept more than three hours, and he was enjoying the freedom of not having to go to work and having the possibility of going to sleep whenever he liked. He was so happy that he quit the guild that he was now gripping his pillow from happiness. While he was doing that, he realized that he was hungry and that he should go eat something. He woke up from his sleep, put on his clothes and went straight to a local restaurant. The waitress working there was happy to see him and she brought him his usual food. What Aix usually had at the restaurant was slime food that was packaged like a children's juice and Aix had that not because it was tasty, but rather because it replenished his power in no more than 10 seconds. However, while the waitress held the slime food in her hand and waited for our protagonist to give her the money for it, he didn't say a word and instead he just chose to sit down at the table. The waitress was surprised by this and at first she thought that something was wrong, but then she realized that Aix was actually going to eat there in the restaurant. It seemed that that was going to happen for the very first time and she immediately shouted to her boss that Aix was going to stay seated for the meal and that he refused to buy the Jeroma's slime food. The waitress hurried to bring our protagonist the menu and when he covered his face with it, he wondered whether they had always been so thoughtful of him. Aix studied the menu for some time, but the same thing happened like in the local store, everything he saw was new for him. Therefore he decided to take anything the house recommended and the waitress told her boss to prepare their special order. The boss was fired up, mainly because Aix was sitting down to eat and also because he wanted to make the special order as good as possible. Not too long after, the food was ready and the waitress brought it to our protagonist's table. <laughs> What the hell happened with my inhale right now? I can cut this out so you bros don't hear this, but I'm gonna leave it in. Anyways, our protagonist's stomach was growling, already growling at that point, and he immediately took the spoon and tried the soup. When he tried it, Tears formed in his eyes and the waitress looked super anxious behind him. He never ate in the restaurant and that's why both her and the boss wanted everything to be perfect. The reason why Aix cried was because his food was warm for the first time in the past 5 years and the waitress shouted back to the boss to notify him that the food was too hot which was a complete misunderstanding. Aix thought to himself that the food looked okay but the taste it had was great and it was good to replenish his spirit. It was very tasty and that made Aix remember all the times he had to eat that Jerome slime food which had no taste. Having experienced that, our protagonist was now able to fully enjoy the meal and once he was finished, he thanked the waitress for the food and said that everything was amazing. The waitress asked Aix whether he had some free time because she wanted to have a word or two with him and she even called herself Aix's bigger sister but he kinda didn't like that. He told her that he had all the time in the world as he had quit his job. So the waitress once again misunderstood what Aix said and she thought that he was going to start working at the restaurant and that they would become colleagues. But before the story escalated, our protagonist interrupted her and told her that he didn't plan on working there, he waved her goodbye and left the restaurant, which made the waitress feel a little bit let down. Aix decided that he was going to walk home in order to digest the food he just ate, but his heart started thumping like crazy and he felt the need to sit. He was in so much pain that he couldn't stand up and he attracted the attention of a nearby lady that happened to be passing by. She rushed to see whether everything was okay and our protagonist felt a little bit embarrassed. The lady was visibly concerned, but all Aix could think of was about how close she stood next to him. He gathered his thoughts and he apologized for scaring her. Our protagonist said it was only a matter of his buffing magic stopping to work and he added how that happened to him quite often. And the name of that buffing magic that Aix used was the most original name ever. Its name was Support One and the way it worked was that it activated a lot of buffs at the same time and all of the following stats, strength, health, 
points, agility, intelligence, mana points and ability power were all raised by one. It was Aix's go to spell when he needed a boost and he used it on himself once again and he was as good as new and the lady was shocked to see him well when he was kneeling down just a moment ago. She explained to our protagonist that she also gets tired very easily because she was doing a lot of research and it required a lot of endurance and strength. She apologized to our protagonist because now it's evident that he didn't need any help after all. Even though our protagonist didn't need her help, he was grateful to her because she was ready to help nonetheless without knowing his circumstances. Because of that reason, Aix said that he was going to use his buffing magic on her and that that would give her the necessary strength and endurance which would last for an entire month. The girl smiled kindly but she was clearly exhausted from work but she low-key didn't believe that Aix's magic would be a big difference to her. So he pointed his magic staff at her and cast his spell. The next moment the lady became a totally different person. She was full of life and she felt like she had enough power to move mountains let alone do her research. In all her awe and surprise she just barely remembered that Aix was the one responsible for that and he told her that that was only the beginner spell as he could only use basic magic. The lady felt strong and lively enough and she believed that she could do anything she set her mind onto. The lady thanked Alex and she turned around and started running like crazy. She said that she was going to hurry up to complete her research and Aix reminded her that she had plenty of time as the buffs would last for an entire month. Aix used that buffing magic only on his previous colleagues from the guild and he thought to himself that the lady was making it into something way bigger than it actually was. Meanwhile, at the Adventurer's Guild, Patisse came down and said that they had a lucky day and their rewards were huge. His whole clan was with him and it seemed that they were doing some bonus quest which brought a lot of money. A young lady with a witch hat on her head agreed with Patisse and she said that not everyone could be a good adventurer as it required people to be smart. Patisse carried a large bag over his shoulder and he emptied the contents at the receptionist's desk and told her to appraise these valuables that they have found. She took her magnifying glass and started examining all the items and it didn't take her too long to understand that they had really outdone themselves that time. She congratulated them on such a haul and she added that the biggest mana stone was from an orc king that had a specific name which was the devourer king of the carnal lust. On top of that the zombies clan managed to defeat 8 shadow wolves and 15 orcs. The receptionist couldn't even understand how they managed to defeat so many monsters on their own and Patisse only said that that was a secret and he wasn't willing to share it. Do these numbers sound familiar bros? Patisse thought to himself how lucky he and his crewmates had been because they just went into the forest and all of that stuff was lying around which meant that somebody had to take down all those monsters beforehand and Patisse thought it was someone from the ranks of the forest guards. However we perfectly know who that one is and it was none other than our boy Aix. But this was grateful to whoever had defeated all these monsters, but he would probably be shocked if he found out that it was actually our Giga Chat protagonist. The receptionist paid them their money for the mana stones, and Patisse stretched out his hands like when you do after some hard work, even though he hadn't done anything that tiring. He probably didn't do anything at all. He just came in, picked the loot, and carried it back to the guild. Maybe this is a little bit tiring. Anyways, he told his crewmates that they should reward themselves for having a great month by buying some alcohol and celebrating, but his crewmates weren't feeling all too well to celebrate. When Patisse asked them what was the exact reason behind that, they simply answered that they didn't feel the strength and endurance as they had before. And even the guild master agreed with them and he thought to himself that it must be because Aix stopped using his buff magic on them and the effects were wearing off. The guild master understood that what he did with Aix was a mistake and he ordered his receptionist to go and find him and bring him back to the guild. The guild master Master said that Aix would immediately be promoted to a B rank adventurer if he chose to come back and the receptionist saluted like a soldier, soldier sir. But this and his crewmates decided to celebrate and he was treating everyone to drinks and food and whatnot. But what he and his remaining two crewmates failed to understand was that they were strong because of Aix's buffing magic and that's what kept them 
from becoming tired. On top of that, they earned most of their money from very strong monsters and they never admitted to themselves that they weren't the ones that defeated them on their own. The monsters were either totally defeated or largely weakened by none other than our boy Aches again and they were just there to reap the rewards. And in the meantime, while Patisse and his clan were celebrating, Aches was slowly returning back to the inn and he was very pleased with how his day had gone up until that point. He ate well, took a walk and he thought to himself that he was going to spend the rest of the day relaxing in his room. When he came closer to the inn, he heard some voices and saw a big crowd of people around one of those passages between houses. Ake stopped to take a look, but he decided he wasn't going to stick his nose there because he wanted to rest. And just as he continued to walk away, he overheard one of the people from the crowd saying something about a teddy bear and it possibly being alive. That caught Aix's attention and the living bear phrase reminded him of one person and he decided he was going to take a look after all. He turned back and he saw a little girl holding a teddy bear in her arms. It was the same girl from before that thought about Aix and apparently her name was Luca. When she saw Aix, she immediately started nagging him about how long she waited for him to arrive. She even took her bear and slapped him with it a couple of times. Our protagonist understood what happened. Luca had probably come to visit him but as he hadn't been there and his room was locked, she couldn't go inside the inn and that's why she had decided to hide in one of the passages between the houses to hide from other other people as she didn't want to be seen. Luca was a puppet magician and she was rather shy. Our protagonist took her to a nearby cafe called the Silent Cat and they sat down to have a word or two. Luca was someone who ran a business on her own with the help of her puppets. However, she wondered what happened that Aix had to cancel his Buffin magic contract because her business was taking a hit as well. Aix was sitting across her and he simply told her that he resigned from being an adventurer and being part of a guild. Laka was rather surprised to hear that and she thought that Aix was going to travel somewhere far away and just the thought of that made her a little bit sad. But our protagonist drank his coffee and he said that he wasn't planning on going anywhere. Laka was already panicking but she tried to tell Aix that everything was okay. He understood that she depended on his buffing magic because her business was suffering and he reached out with his hand, hovered it over her teddy bear and cast his support one spell. The bear's ears sort of shook very fast and it was as if Aix had poured life into the plush toy. The bear immediately jumped onto Aix's hand and he started apologizing for hitting him moments ago. Not that he could have done anything to prevent that because there wasn't much life in him after all he was being controlled by Laka. Anyways, the plushie was actually named Crazy Bear and it was a name that fitted well because the bear looked a bit scary. Cute, but scary. The bear was thankful to Aix for bringing him back to life and Aix explained the whole situation with the bear. They first met when Laka sent out a personal request and Aix used his buffing magic and they even signed a contract that would extend the magic for as long as the contract was alive. The bear even started talking because the buffing magic gave him plus one intelligence points but Aix knew that as soon as the buff wore off the bear would lose both his ability to talk and a great portion of his life livelihood. Laka thanked Aix for using his magic on him once again and she told Aix that she really wanted him to stay and the bear agreed with her and said that they depended on him a great deal. Aix and Laka continued to talk about the recent events and why Aix decided to quit working for the guild and he told her everything about his last quest and all that. That made Laka very angry which in turn made Aix really happy because someone actually cared about him and his feelings. She even said that she would go to the guild and that she would beat everyone one up but that wasn't necessary because her feelings of compassion and kindness towards Aix were more than enough. He thanked her and they stepped outside and started walking towards Laka's place but Aix remembered that he needed something from the inn and then he asked Laka whether it would be okay if they stopped by there so he could finish what he needed to do. Laka just nodded because she was too shy to speak in public and our protagonist thought to himself how she felt like a doll herself. They arrived at the inn and when they climbed the stairs to Aix's room, they stumbled upon the guild's receptionist. She greeted them and told Aix 
that she had been waiting for him as there was something she needed to tell him. Ake felt a bit agitated as he knew that seeing people from the life he chose to leave behind wasn't actually the way he envisioned his freedom. They entered Ake's room and he was a bit shocked by the fact that two very cute girls were in his room during daylight hours. The receptionist couldn't wait and she told Ake that she had great news for him, or at least that's how she looked on the entire situation. She told him that if he came back they would immediately offer him a C-rank contract and he would be promoted to a B rank in just a month. Our protagonist just sighed and told her that he had already decided and that his decision to quit was still as firm as the moment he said it out loud. On top of that, Aix couldn't understand why they were giving him such an offer because he was only an F rank adventurer at the time of his resignation. The receptionist didn't know the exact reason but she tried to come up with what she thought would be a convincing story. So she said that the guildmaster only wanted to test Aix and see how he would react in a certain situation and that he was giving him the promotions because he was pleased with the way Aix behaved himself. However, Aix wasn't buying her story at all but the receptionist went on to say how the guild would only accept personal requests from upper class people and hearing the phrase personal requests only made Aix's stomach turn. And to finish her speech and to round up the guild's offer to our protagonist, the receptionist said that she would be open to go on a date with him if he ever chose to ask her out. What the hell? Oh my god. Is she selling her body for him to come back to guild? What? Even though Aix didn't have time to think about his answer, he thought to himself that that was an immediate no. He remembered that he wasn't alone in the room with the receptionist and he turned around to signal Laka that everything was alright and that he wasn't planning on going back to the guild. Aix turned back to the receptionist, put on his serious face, he took a deep breath before he spoke his mind, and just when he started to tell his final response to the receptionist, Crazy Bear jumped over him and told the receptionist that she should shut her mouth and listen to him. Crazy Bear was angry because the receptionist only came to give that offer to Aix because that was convenient to the guild and to her as well. Everyone was surprised at the bear's reaction but the receptionist was shocked to see a plush toy speak like a human being. Our protagonist was calm with a smile on his face because the bear actually said the things along the lines of what he was about to say and Laka stood there saying nothing with her arms crossed. But the bear wasn't done talking, he told the receptionist that they weren't going to fool anyone by the whole test story. He said that he knew perfectly well that all magicians had to start from rank C from the beginning because they were becoming so rare in society. With that being said, it was evident that the guild master tricked Aix from the very start and that lasted for full 5 years which meant that he had stolen a lot of money that originally belonged to our protagonist. Both Aix and the receptionist were shocked to hear that and Aix couldn't come to terms with the fact that they were being schooled by a plush toy with one one stat in intelligence. Crazy Bear painted his plush boy at the receptionist like he was holding a sword and he told her that it should have been the guild master that came to see Aix and the first thing they needed to do was to apologize for tricking him and the receptionist felt like she was being attacked by a real sword. How threatening it was. Aix told her his final decision and he said that he wasn't planning on returning to the guild and the receptionist left the inn with her hopes entirely crushed. Laka reminded Aix that he needed to thank Crazy Bear for his wonderful arguments and that's exactly what our protagonist did. He looked very happy and that made Crazy Bear feel happy too that he even said that Aix could call him Lucky Bear from there on. But our protagonist realized that the bear couldn't have known all those things on his own and it was probably Laka that taught him everything. So with that in mind, it was actually Laka that required Aix's gratitude and he thanked her. That made Aix realize that he had very good friends like Laka and the bear and Lina and her mom and the people from the restaurant were also very good friends to him. <laughs> I don't know what was up with this sentence construction, my brain just lagged. Now in the meantime, the receptionist came back to the guild and she explained everything to the guild master. The guild master was very very angry but that wasn't his biggest concern 
at the moment. The reception is brought in a couple more reports of monsters not having been defeated in the requested time and a lot more quests haven't been finished successfully. On top of that, none of the guild members were coming to the guild in the first place because everyone was feeling very tired and sick. The guild master didn't know what to do nor what was the exact reason behind all that but it was obvious that Aix's buffing magic was surely wearing off and it was only a matter of time until the guild needed to close down. Now back in Aix's room, he spent some time playing with Lucky Bear and Lucky Bear said that he felt rather energized and that he almost forgot that he had a heated debate with the receptionist just a couple of moments ago. But our protagonist then turned around to Laka and asked her about her business and whether everything was was okay. She didn't say anything but Aix knew all too well that her puppets were a lot more efficient when they were buffed by his magic and he was even worried about that when he was quitting the guild. My bro was actually thinking about her. How nice of him. Luck wasn't saying a thing though and Aix was a little bit confused by that. She finally decided to explain that after she listened to Aix talk about how he felt about working, she couldn't possibly make herself ask him to to work some more as that would make her a demon in her eyes and maybe in his eyes as well. Aix joked with Laka and asked her how Lucky Bear was any different because Laka was very protective of him. But Laka reminded Aix of one thing. She told him that her business could scrape through tough times if she cuts back on production and she told Aix that he shouldn't feel responsible for none of that. She told him that he shouldn't feel sorry for anything that wasn't his fault and that everything was going to continue even without his help because the world isn't going to stop spinning. It's gonna slow down maybe but it's not gonna stop spinning because he decided to quit his job at the guild. She finished what she had to say and told Aix to relax and get some quality rest and Aix thanked her. Laka didn't have anything more to say and she told Aix that she was leaving but Aix wasn't going to let her woke woke hope. Ah! My brain is getting slow with pronunciation of words. Woke slow home by herself so he chose to accompany her. <laughs> Meanwhile the receptionist at the guild was apologizing to different people and she kept saying how Aix quit a couple of days before and that time it was the former guild master that came looking for him. He was visibly angry but he was a bit worried about Aix. However the former guild master blamed our protagonist for everything that happened in his tavern. All of his best ingredients went to waste because Aix chose to quit his job and not sustain his ice magic in the kitchen. So he was furious and he said that the contract clearly stated that if anything was to go wrong, no one but Aix... What is the invasion finally happening? Can you hear this sound? Am I going crazy and just hearing this in my brain or... What? So many distractions today. I'm so sorry, bros. I'm so sorry. Anyways, uh, he said that if the contract was to go wrong early, no one but Aix would be responsible to blame. So he was certain that he was 100% right and he ushered the receptionist to read the contract to check whether what he said was true or not. However, as the receptionist finished going through the contract, she told the former guildmaster that his contract had a big flaw and that it didn't bind people who weren't in the guild. The former guildmaster thought that that was outrageous and if that was the case, he demanded that someone else comes and finishes his personal request. There wasn't much the receptionist could do to help him and she just smiled and thanked him for coming. So the former guildmaster stormed off from the adventurer's guild and just when he left, a party came back from a quest. The receptionist was sorry to hear that the quest had been failed yet again and the adventurers said that something was strange as they were able to defeat the enemies just days ago but now they seemed a lot stronger. The enemies did not a party obviously. <laughs> the receptionist was very worried about the guild because just that month 
nine different quests had been failed and in the entire previous year there had been only three failed quests in the entire year so every party that failed the quest had the same excuse and no one could understand what was going on and why was that happening the guildmaster was furious with all the adventurers from the guild and he thought that they were just being lazy and slacking off and the adventurers begged him to hold a provisional meeting as no one had been feeling very well lately. I probably belong in this guild as well because I don't feel very well. Bros, I actually, I'm joking. In the yesterday's video, part one of this manga, I said at the very beginning that I'm tired of everything and I've gotten so, so, so many comments asking me if I'm alright, what's going on. I really appreciate it, bros. I'm I'm better than ever in my life. My life has been amazing this last year, ever since I made this YouTube channel. It's all thanks to you, bros. I really appreciate your concerns about me, but there's no need to worry. So thank you for the concerns, but I'm fine. I'm just memeing around. I'm sorry for yet another distraction. This is literally only a couple more pictures left of the manga and I couldn't help myself but to be distracted but it's I have to thank you bros anyways the guild master came up with a plan and he decided to hold the meeting after all that was the last thing he could do to try to keep the guild moving and running and keep the guild up and now we see the guild master's plan which was the following he gathered every adventurer from the guild and he told them that they were about to receive his special training and that because of that they were all going to be as strong as the members of the strongest clan which is zombies clan that was actually the rumor that's been spread throughout the guild and it seemed that it was the day for everyone to receive this so-called special training the rumor also had it that it made people quite stronger and they also became somewhat addicted to that strength. The guildmaster started the meeting by saying how his adventurers needed to be aware of both their surroundings and themselves and they needed to never stop thinking about their abilities. The guildmaster didn't prepare a long speech for the meeting and he was almost done. The only thing he had to add was that everyone that was present at the meeting was about to receive a buff from a mage called Ares and the buff would hopefully help everyone on their quests. That was the guildmaster's plan and the entire guild clapped to show gratitude for the guildmaster's generosity. However, it seemed that something wasn't quite right and we'll only find out what after the meeting. So the guildmaster hurried towards the little girl called Ares to receive her buffs. Ares tried to speak with the guildmaster on that matter and she couldn't quite understand why she should buff anyone as there was no clear threat to the guild. However, the guildmaster told her not to ask so many questions and he ordered her just to listen to his directions and that was basically her only option and she ended up doing as the guild master asked from her. The first one in the line to receive Ares' blessing was a mage who was known by the name of Rapid Fire Mara and she was actually an S rank adventurer. Right when Ares saw her, she decided to give her a plus one buff on her mana points and Mara seemed to like it. Ares used her magic and Mara immediately felt stronger. So she thanked her and Ares looked after Mara while she walked away and Ares was amazed with how she used her intermediate magic spells in quick succession and with a limited mana pool. But before Ares could think about that some more, she had a full stacked line of adventurers begging her to give them their buffs. Ares told them to approach her one by one and that everyone should decide which buff they wanted. And she also had a lot of work waiting to be done and she worked very hard to buff everyone. You see, done everyone and I have to stop with my very cringy rhymes i'm sorry however soon after she was finished people started noticing that the buffs were wearing off almost immediately aries couldn't understand why everyone was coming back and she was practically shocked there were even comments that said how she might have been an inferior magician and that one in particular caught her attention aries tried to defend herself from such comments and she said that it was only normal for the buffs to be wearing off as they only ever Ever do last just around 10 minutes and that's why she was trying to explain to the guild master that it would be pointless to buff everyone at the meeting. However, Mara stood in front of her and confronted her by saying how Aegis buffed them as well before and his buffs lasted for a full month. Mara was clearly very angry and she said that she was going to have a much more difficult time dealing with monsters without any buffs. She also explained that even though her magic was very efficient, there was a downside to that 
that as well. And the downside was that she didn't have a big mana pool, so without the buffs she couldn't possibly keep on shooting her spells. And without the buffs, there were only two ways that would restore her mana. One of them was sleeping, which was practically impossible in the midst of the battle, and the other one was drinking heaps of mana potions, but that was also a bad idea because she would get nauseous. But it wasn't only Mara that was complaining, everyone was, and everyone was in dire need of the buffed magic. Now, Ares did what was in her power, and she tried to explain to everyone that buffing magic only ever lasted for 10 minutes, around 10 minutes, and she could swear her life on it as she had studied magic her entire life. The adventurers couldn't come to terms with what she was saying because that would mean that they aren't going to be able to finish quests because they lack the buffing magic to help them. Some of them said that it would be good if they found another support mage to buff them, but they were soon silenced by people who listened to what Ares just said about buffing magic only ever lasting 10 minutes. But Ares was deep in her thoughts and she couldn't stop herself from thinking that there was something very special to Aix's buffing magic. The guildmaster saw how displeased his adventurers were and Mara confronted him by saying how he was the one that made Aegs quit the guild and that only meant that he should also be the one to talk to him to try and bring him back into the guild and she had the full unanimous support from the entire guild. The receptionist came to the guildmaster and at first she only stared at him for some time and after a moment or two she finally said why she was there. She explained to the guildmaster that the guild members were really displeased and angry and everyone thought that the guildmaster should apologize. The guildmaster acted like he didn't know what the receptionist was talking about and like he couldn't understand to whom. Who is he supposed to apologize? Huh? <laughs> so this angered the receptionist so much that she grabbed her paws by the collar and told him to stop acting dumb. She shouted Aix's name a couple of times and kindly asked her boss to go and apologize to our protagonist as that was their only way out of their current problems. While all the commotion was happening back in the guild, Aix was walking through the city streets because he didn't have anything better to do. On his walk, a woman recognized him and she called him the way everyone at the guild used to call him a defect mage. She held her knife in her hand and was lucky to have come across Aix as she wanted him to sharpen her knife and raise its sharpness by 10 points. Aix felt completely unfazed by her words and he simply responded that he wasn't taking any more personal requests for quite some time now. The woman was a bit surprised because she thought that the sharpening of a knife didn't take too long but Aix wasn't interested in the very least. She thought that he was acting strange and high and mighty and she said that she would just go to a shop that specialized in sharpening knives but she didn't realize that she would have to pay much, much more than Aix. Aix couldn't care less about the woman nor about her dull knife. He had his fair share of lousy requests and he never picked between them. He took all of them on and successfully finished all of them. But now the times have changed and our protagonist wasn't taking any quests anymore. The sentence that Laka told him was ringing in his head and it seemed that she was absolutely right. Aix started to realize that it was okay for him to say no to people and that didn't mean that the people were left hopeless and without any other choice. There was always someone else to ask for help and our protagonist didn't really have any obligation to accept any of those personal requests. Aix stopped at an alley to pet a stray cat but someone passed him by and then they returned. They noticed and recognized him and they immediately started calling him names. It was the zombies clan, Patisse and his two crewmates and Aix knew there was probably going to be trouble as seeing them wasn't going to bring any good luck. And indeed Aix was right as Patisse pushed him onto the ground. Our protagonist fell and hit his head on a box that was there, however he wasn't going to let that distract him any further and his facial expression changed and he seemed a lot more determined. He wasn't going to be nice guy anymore and he glared their way. Patisse kept insulting him and even asked him why he he looked angry. As our protagonist
Ares was standing up and shaking off the dust from his robes, but this didn't stop with the bombardment of insults. But our protagonist thought to himself how times were different before and how he probably would never say anything back to Patisse and how he would apologize for standing in his way or something like that. But those days have been long gone for aches, maybe like four days ago because he quit his job four days ago, and just like he had the courage to resign, he plucked up the courage required for him to defend himself. Our protagonist was dead serious and he kindly asked Patisse to apologize to him. But this was clearly offended by Aik's statement and our protagonist once again repeated his phrase and he once again asked Patisse to apologize to him. Patisse had no intentions of apologizing and he thought that Aix must have been crazy saying something like that and Patisse's left hand was already gripping the handle of his knife. My bro has no chill. He was ready to attack Aix at any time to inflict serious damage to him with his magic sword that's called Ignition. Our protagonist knew that that was what adventurers usually did. They immediately reached for their weapons and they threatened their opponents but Aix was having none of that. He wasn't going to let that slide for Patisse and he was quicker. Aix used his ice enchantment and Patisse didn't even realize anything particular happened. He didn't even pay much attention to our protagonist as he always thought that he was inferior to him and Patisse was angry that Aix even tried to cast a spell onto him and he was hurrying to take out his knife but it seemed that he was having trouble pulling it out. Patisse thought that Aix must have done something and our protagonist didn't tell a word at the start because Patisse was so dumb to figure it out on his own. However, it took Patisse a while before looking down to his sword just to find that it had been completely frozen both the handle and the scabbard. Aix just calmly informed Patisse that his sword would remain frozen for an entire month and Patisse realized that Aix outsmarted him which made him even angrier. But that also angered Patisse's crewmates who stood in their leader's defense and they started to threaten Aix as well. Our protagonist was so disappointed with the whole situation and how he felt about everything. He wasn't the one that attacked them, rather it was the other way around and despite all that, Aix still decided not to go all out on them and he wondered what would be the right amount to scare them off and make them leave. But Aix realized that if they were to attack him any further, he would have to resort to using his most destructive spells and they would then have a hard time getting out of there alive. And just as our protagonist Agnes was thinking about all that, someone came down running and shouted at them. Two people came in Aix's aid and one of them was the waitress from the restaurant where Aix had his first proper meal after 5 years and the other person was her sister. They came to help Aix because they thought that going 3v1 was completely unfair and they were there to make the odds a little bit more leveled. Aix recognized the other person by her voice, he had never seen her but he recognized her as the owner of that same restaurant and it seemed to really be true, the restaurant functioned properly and it had only two employees which were sisters after all. But this tried to lie his way out of that situation and he started by saying how he was just called in Aix but before he could say anything else, the owner of the restaurant told him to shut his mouth. She was giga angry and she was willing to fight them on her own but before she mentioned anything else, she asked Patisse to pay up for the bill that they racked up the month before. The owner was kind to wait for them but now they even violated their extended period by 3 full days. Patisse was clearly feeling uncomfortable but he tried to play it cool and act like he was untouchable as he said that making him your enemy isn't the best thing you can do. Aix stood behind the sisters that ran the restaurant and he was amazed with their bravery. They chose to stand with him and they did that against the most powerful clan from the guild. Our protagonist knew he had to help them and he used his support magic to sharpen the sisters knives and they were amazed that their knives were sharp once again. Aix also used his support one spell and raised all of their stats by one but the way the sisters felt, it felt like Aix gave them infinite power. The sisters were really fired up and that intimidated Patisse now as well. He was intimidated so much so that he felt the need to say that what he did with Aix was only a joke and he tried to lie his way out of that mess. Patisse turned around and by saying that he would come soon to pay off his debt, he started walking away. However, Aix wasn't going to let them 
him walk away just like that and he told him to turn around and to apologize to him. But this was shocked to hear that but he was obliged to apologize which was indeed a huge shame for him. He turned around quicker and together with his crewmates left the scene. Our protagonist couldn't believe and me too with him. I can't believe what just happened and he couldn't believe that he had just made the leader of the zombies clan apologize to him like that. But he didn't have the time to process that event as the sisters were quick to start celebrating our protagonist's victory. They told him that he was amazing and Aix felt like thanking them as well for standing up for him. The owner said that people like Aix were always welcome in their restaurant and she invited him to come later that day. They even asked him what he would order and Aix tried to act cool so he said that he would order a big manly specialty of the house. Meanwhile Patisse was furious with the fact that Aix had just tricked him and he knew what a defeat that was. Patisse immediately made plans for revenge and he thought to himself how he would recruit more guys and he would order them to beat Aix up. While Patisse was fuming around in the lounge room of the guild, his little crewmate came running down the hall very happily. She entered the room and shared the good news with Patisse. The personal request for the zombies clan had finally arrived and it was the same task like before from the forest guides. But this facial expression changed immediately and he thought to himself that they would earn enough money so he could pay off his debt at the restaurant. The zombies immediately packed themselves and they made their way towards the demon forest. They walked a bit deeper into the forest but something felt off and Patisse was feeling rather anxious. He kept looking all around himself but the mana stones were nowhere to be seen. That in itself was too suspicious to them and on top of that one shadow wolf jumped out in front of them and both Patisse and his two crewmates were scared to death and they ran off screaming. While well, they were busy with running for their lives they couldn't come to terms with the fact that all of the monsters were actually alive that time. One of Patisse's crewmates by the name of Dwarf stumbled and fell. Patisse noticed that and he turned around to see Dwarf calling out for help but as he was too scared they didn't turn back to help their friend and that was the last day that anyone had ever seen Dwarf. What a friendly party, they are really good friends. Patisse and the little girl had ran for some time until they thought they were safe but Patisse couldn't understand how the monsters were all still alive. What happened was that the forest guards weren't doing their jobs just like Aik said in the beginning and it was always the one that had to do their jobs and for some reason probably because Aix was an E rank mage he was forbidden from taking the mana stones and that's why the zombies could have always kept them for themselves. But Batiste of course never thought that Aix could have anything to do with that. On top of that he was getting distracted because his second crewmate Elfman had literally pooped his pants and Patisse couldn't even think straight from all that lovey-dovey smell. That was also the last day when the zombies were thought to be the strongest clan in the guild. Now that being said, their budget was cut down and Patisse had to resort to something he never thought he would need to do. He entered the smith's shop and he immediately started making excuses from the front door. He kept saying stuff about how he lost his wallet and he started walking around the shop. The shop owner recognized him but it was rare to see Patisse in his shop so he got interested as to why Patisse was there. My dog got interested as well so he's asking by saying woof woof. This, I'm sorry for his barking. I, I, I hope you're used to it by now. At least it's not construction sounds happening in the back right? Right only the dog. No construction sounds. Anyways. Uh, the shop owner thought that there was only one reason Patisse was in his shop and that was to buy another weapon and he immediately started pitching one of his weapons to Patisse but Patisse had to disappoint him and tell him that he wasn't actually there to buy anything. Patisse reached around his waist unbuckled his belt and he put his precious sword on the counter in front of the shop owner. The shop owner couldn't stop himself from feeling utterly shocked with the fact that Patisse, the leader of the zombies clan, brought in his most precious sword called Ignition. Patisse didn't have time to waste and he just told the shopkeeper to assess his sword. He thought to himself that he would get a good price for his sword and that he won't have to go back to the store anytime soon 
but that turned out to be completely different. The shopkeeper told him that his sword was only worth one gold coin, but as Patis was desperate for money, he felt the need to take the owner's offer. But before he left the shop, he told the owner that he would definitely come back after 30 days and that he was going to buy off that same sword. Sword. What's up with my English? buy off that same sword. But this was going completely mad and he was even furious at the restaurant for reminding him about the debt he had. But there was one thing that gave him hope and those were the bonus quests. However, little did Patisse know that his bonus quests were just a matter of the past and that they were never going to happen. When Patisse left the shop, the shopkeeper took the ignition sword and hanged it on the wall. Now we jump back to someone who we hadn't seen in a very long time and that's Viscount Redlich. The butler welcomed his master back into the mansion and the Viscount walked by joyfully playing a tune in his head. Yes man, if you don't remember, that's the name of the butler. Yes man noticed that his master was in a good mood and he asked him what made him so happy. The Viscount seemed like he was just waiting for someone to ask him something and he quickly responded to his butler. The Viscount said that he was happy because of the invention he thought of and which AX created and we all know that it was actually AX that both invented and created the thing and it was quite possible that Yesman also knew that but he was a Yesman so he kept his mouth shut. And the Viscount said that he was in a meeting with the princess and she felt intrigued by the invention as a whole. The Viscount gave her one and he also promised that he would make sure to bring another one for the princess's friend. Yes man, butler yes man flattered his master but he informed him about a problem they have. And you guessed it, the problem was Aix having already quit the guild a long time ago. The Viscount wasn't going to hear no as an answer and he told the yes man to bring Aix to his mansion by any means. The Viscount thought to himself that Aix was jobless and that he would probably cry tears of joy when the Viscount gave him an offer. Yesman bowed his head in obedience and he said that he was going to look for Aix as soon as he possibly could and added that when Aix finally comes, his first job back would be to create 200 of those inventions of his. The Viscount thought that his butler Yesman had great aspirations with such an attitude and he commended him by saying that he could potentially become a nobleman one day and Yesman thanked him. When the Viscount left the premises, Yesman was finally able to breathe out a sigh of relief. That was stressful for him because the mansion kept experiencing a lot of problems lately and it was all somehow connected to aches or better yet lack of aches to help them with the problems. He had a very hard time replacing the magic lights but in the end he had no other choice but to put up torches. All of those problems were causing a headache for our butler, yes man. As he was thinking about how to approach Aix and bring him back to the mansion, another problem was looming over his head. Namely, the head maiden came as she had something to say. A new problem just came into existence. The ice ball in the biggest room, room 7, had melted and the head maid wanted it fixed. She told Yesman that it would be great if some mage could come and finish that as soon as possible. However, Yesman explained her why that might not be possible. He simply told her to throw out all of the ingredients and to use what could be used, but the head maid didn't like that idea very much. Yesman turned around and told her that he was about to tell her in on a secret but it had to remain between the two of them. The headmaid said that she wouldn't tell a living soul and Yesman explained to her how he saw the whole situation. He realized that there was something really special about the magic that our protagonist used and it seemed that only he was able to use that special magic. He told her everything that Aix did in that mansion and his ice wasn't melting, the lights he put up were never going out and even the water bucket had an infinite source of water and no one else even came close to achieving in any of that. The headmate told Yesman that she didn't have that impression of Aix as she had seen him perform his magic before and to her it looked like child's play. Yesman said that there was nothing unordinary about his magic except the duration which was for some reason unexpectedly long. The headmate understood the gravity of the problem and she pleaded with Yesman to bring our protagonist back. She told that if they don't fix their problems their dignity would become endangered and Yesman 
Watchmen said that he was thinking about how to approach our protagonist. He thought that if they gave him a lot of money and a seat at a discussion making table, that there was no way he was going to refuse. Aix walked some more and he decided he was going to see Laka. He came to her workshop and he found a strange sight in front of her shop. He saw a plush toy stuck in the post box in the front of the shop and it made Aix quite intrigued. The plushie was even wiggling its feet and it seemed it was stuck and it was trying to get out. Our protagonist thought to himself that he shouldn't just stand there so he took the plushie by the legs and dragged its head out of the post box. The plushie managed to get its head out without serious injuries and it was a cute little rabbit. That was only normal as Laka's workshop was filled with all sorts of bunnies and even though they almost all looked the same to everyone except Laka, Laka said that she could recognize each and every single one of them. Aix remembered how Laka told him that she would somehow get by without using his buffing magic, but things weren't looking that great as the bunny that Aix just pulled out again went headfirst into the post box and ended up stuck again. Our protagonist decided that there was nothing he could do to stop the bunny from doing that and he went for the bell. Aix rang the bell but he realized that Laka was a pretty shy girl and that she wasn't going out that much. That's why she gave Aix a spare key so he could come and visit her whenever he wanted. This is a typical guy. A girl is gonna give you literally the keys of her house and tell you to come whenever you want. And you're not gonna take this hint that she likes you. You're gonna be like, oh, maybe she just wants to, wants me to fix her sink. Yeah. <laughs> Anyways, Aix opened the door on his own and apologized for coming inside uninvited. He explained how magic worked in that world, and we find that out for the first time. Magic followed certain principles and rules from what was known as the Hollow Realm, which was in fact a realm where demons reside. So in that realm, certain hollows had certain abilities, and magic was what connected that realm and the real world. So basically what mages did was that they were able to control those hollows as they liked and they used their powers and that was considered magic. The way those two worlds were connected was with the help of magical instruments and mages applied all of those principles to their bodies and hence they became powerful. However, there was a catch. To be able to control someone from the hollow realm and use their powers, the mages had to sign a contract with them and the contract usually deprived the mages of something. The hollows usually deprived the mages of things they wished for. For example, Laka, she wished to be a puppeteer, but the price she had to pay for that was enduring loneliness. She became fearful of humans and that's why she used her magic to make lively plushies to try and compensate for that social need. Our protagonist thought to himself that what Laka was in dire need of is a friend and her puppets ended up being her friends. However, her puppets were very jealous of others and Laka lost all the courage she had to approach other humans. Aix even said that the first time he ever heard Laka speak was the time when Lucky Bear first spoke out. It was a surprise for both of them and ever since that day they were good friends. Aix entered Laka's workshop and he saw something strange already. A ball of yarn was rolling on the floor and a small plush bunny walked behind it. A thread from the yarn ball got stuck in between its legs and the bunny tripped and fell. Laka came out the room to help her bunny up but she was greeted by Aix, something that she wasn't expecting at all. Laka was terrified but that was only because she was extremely shy and our protagonist apologized for coming without prior notice. Laka told him that she was glad that he came, but he could have at least rang the bell when he arrived. Aix explained that he did indeed ring the bell, but he was more concerned about the mess in her workshop, and Laka just brushed him off saying how it was nothing to be concerned about. However, taking into consideration everything that happened by then, Aix knew that something had to be off and he entered Laka's room even though she was against that idea. Aix saw a rabbit that was lying under a heap of materials. Aix was surprised and confused at the same time and Laka finally admitted and said what was going on. She said that if the jobs she gave to her plushies were just a tiny bit difficult, 
there seemed to be a problem and they start acting a bit crazy. And she finally plucked up the courage to tell Aix that she was in dire need of his help. Our protagonist apologized for not visiting her any sooner and he understood that Laka's plushies weren't able to function without his buff in intelligence. Aix knew what he needed to do and he ended up using his magic to buff Laka's puppets. Their ears perked up and the one under the rubble of material quickly got up, ran towards Laka and Aix and bowed down to express his gratitude. Aix was happy that his magic worked again and Laka thanked him but she also said that he didn't have to do anything else. Lucky Bear also clinged to our protagonist's leg and told him that he did enough already. Aix heard his heart thumping and he felt like a hero for a second. Laka was keeping quiet on the doorstep and Aix told her that she didn't have to worry, he was going to help her as he was the only one that could do it and he thought of it as his duty to help all of Laka's bunnies. Our protagonist went around the house and used his support one spell on all the bunnies he could find and after some time there was only one room left. Aix entered in a flashy way but he was surprised by the number of the bunnies inside. It looked like a real factory and the bunnies worked very hard. Just the sight of them made Aix remember why he quit being an adventurer and working for the guild but nonetheless he told all the bunnies to line up as they were about to be buffed. The bunnies started gathering but in no time Aix felt overwhelmed and he didn't know how he would manage everything without making chaos. As he was thinking about his next step, Laka rushingly came from behind him and she hugged him. However, because she was running so fast, they both fell from the impact and Aix was disappointed with himself for not being able to stand tall against a small girl like Laka. He turned around to ask her what was she doing, but Laka wasn't even letting him to speak. She shouted his name and told him that he had done enough already and that he didn't have to do any more. Laka said that the bunnies acted crazy only when they were given difficult tasks and if Aix was so keen on working, Laka was going to find something for him as well. But she knew how he felt and she wanted him to rest. Our protagonist apologized and when they sat on the floor, he said that he did act a little bit weird. The bunnies came and they poured them some tea. Aix thanked the bunnies and they chose to sit at a table instead of being on the floor. Before anything else, Laka gave Aix a big silver coin for the work he just did and at first Aix was hesitant to accept it but Laka made him in the end. As there was no choice Aix took the coin and thanked her. When Aix took the coin only then did Laka proceed to tell him about how she felt. She told him how she got used to a certain way of living because everything was great then and it was hard for her to experience hardships now because of her past. She was aware of the fact that what she used to ask of Aix wasn't easy and it wasn't a small thing but she just couldn't help herself because Aix's buffing magic was just too good. Our protagonist didn't tell a thing and he just enjoyed his tea and that made Laka feel like she was talking to herself. To check whether he was even listening to her, she took one cookie and threw it his way and Aix ended up catching it with his mouth. That made Laka laugh and she took another one and said it was a bonus reward. Aix tried to explain that he hadn't finished eating the first one but it was already too late as Laka threw the second cookie at him as well. However, as Aix's mouth were already full, that one ended up hitting him on the head which made Laka even happier now. She apologized and our protagonist picked up the cookie from the table a little bit confused. He took the cookie and offered it to Laka and said that it wasn't good to play with food. Laka was surprised with his gesture and she ended up eating the cookie but she was already bright red. She was blushing because that was probably the most intimate she had ever been with another human being. And in the meantime, in the office of the Grand Chamberlain, he was brought a report that he asked for. The report was about Aix and it contained his guild card and all of the information that was present about our protagonist. The Grand Chamberlain didn't think that the report was serious as Aix was called a defect mage and his rank was missing. He thought that someone decided to joke with him but the officer that brought him the report told him that everything was right. He even said that the princess was given a magic tool at a party. The officer couldn't find any visible magic stones and yet the tool seemed to work perfectly. 
but the officer couldn't decipher the use for the magic tool and he thought that they should turn it into a weapon. The Grand Chamberlain was still looking at the report and he was intrigued by what was under the section of aspirations. Aix's aspiration was not working and he couldn't understand how a mage in the guild could have put that as his aspiration. The Grand Chamberlain looked at the magic item and he thought to himself about what was going through his head when he invented the breezing fan. A lovely sound was heard from the hall and a small girl entered the room. It was the princess which was the Grand Chamberlain's granddaughter. He was surprised to see her there and he thought to himself that she must have listened in on his conversation with the officer. The princess only told her grandpa that he wouldn't solve anything if he continued worrying without talking to Aix the very person that invented the magical item itself. We see the receptionist hurriedly walking after the guildmaster and asking him why did he give up so easily on making Aix come back to the guild and both the receptionist and the guildmaster were angry but the receptionist thought that even if Aix went to another town they could track him down and still make him return. However, the guildmaster told her that they shouldn't even think about that at all. The receptionist had no other arguments and she remained silent after that. The guild master thought to himself that Aix was really cunning when he came up with the threat of leaving the town and moving away. The guildmaster was also afraid that he was going to be punished by the Viscount because he had already spent the rewards given to him by Yesman and he didn't even want to think about that outcome. The guildmaster had one final plan and he told the receptionist that he would resort to that dirty tactic. The receptionist was completely shocked but she listened to the guildmaster's orders to inform the other adventurers to wait three more more days and then everything would once again be alright. She also thought to herself how she needed to make herself more pretty in that time so Aix could like her when he comes back. The guildmaster went into the guild's deposit room and he made a plan of making Aix listen to him. He thought to himself that a mage like Aix that could only use beginner's magic stood no chance against him. The guildmaster was looking for a specific item and when he finally found it he thought to himself that it was high time he used it. The item in question was a ring and even though the guildmaster thought that using it on Aix would be a complete waste, he had no other choice but to try that. So the ring wasn't any normal ring, its name was the Ring of Slavery and it had all sorts of nasty effects. That magical item lowered all stats by one, made the wearer tired, it kept the wearer in constant connection with the person that put the ring on them and on top of all of that, it was impossible for the wearer to remove it by himself. The guildmaster kept the ring a secret for a long time and it was well hidden in the guild's deposit room. The guildmaster had a sinister look on his face and he decided to read out all the instructions the ring came with but slowly but surely his sinister look changed. He looked rather shocked and confused when he found out that the ring lowered all stats by one and after reading that a terrible thought occurred to him. If Aix could only use the simplest of spells, that meant that his stats were already too low and using the ring on Aix would have no effect as he would become incompetent to use magic at all. The guildmaster was raging with anger because Aix never showed interest in learning any other spells. The guildmaster slammed his fist onto a wooden box and he was really frustrated with the entire situation as that was something he never imagined even in his wildest nightmares. So the thing was that if he couldn't do anything to change Aix's decision, he'd ended up enslaved himself as he would be forced to work as a miner once he was imprisoned. He didn't have any money left as he used the money Yes Man gave him to bribe Aix with to buy himself a huge mansion. Now that wasn't exactly a good idea but one thing did look rather appealing to the guildmaster and he thought to himself as being entitled to it. What the guildmaster talked about was the guild's deposit money. He didn't think that anyone would complain if he decided to take all the money and used it on himself and that's what ended up happening. The guildmaster took all the money, put it into a bag and in from his point of view everything was Aix's fault and he should be the one to blame. The GM, we're gonna call him the GM from now on. The GM was ready to take off but the only way he could use without being seen was going through the demon forest. But he was already a criminal and there was no turning back 
and the only way forward was through the monster infested forest. So the GM thought that he could start a new life for himself if he managed to get out. But as he neared the forest, the guild master saw that a fence had been put up which supposedly kept the town safe from monsters from inside the forest. The GM didn't believe that, as the fence looked very plain and simple, wooden planks connected with barbed wire and having seen it, he felt rather disappointed. The GM heard some rumors that the fence had no effect on people, especially good people, and he thought of himself as one of the best people to ever live. Oh, how non-narcissistic at all. But even though the barbed wire looked plain and simple, it was actually very special. The wire was in the sense that it zapped anyone and anything that came in contact with and the guildmaster soon found that out when he touched the barbed wire. And just as every goblin that touched the wire lost consciousness, the same happened with our GM and he collapsed onto the ground. Some time passed and when the guildmaster regained consciousness, he found himself behind bars and someone was yelling at him to wake up. The GM raised his head and he saw Yes Man from the other side of the bars. The guildmaster also had his arms tied behind his back, which meant that he was imprisoned and Yes Man realized that because he tried to escape the city and it was only logical that the quest to bring eggs back into the guild was a failure. It was only then that the guildmaster realized how he got himself stuck in that situation and blamed the fans because nothing was ever fault his fault in his eyes. Yesman explained that the fence was put up by the forest guards and the forest guards were employed by the Viscount and he only chose the best of people to work for him. However, what Yesman didn't know was that the fence had been put up and electrified entirely by eggs and the forest guards were just slackers like the guildmaster. It was called a barrier fence but it was just a simple fence that eggs used his lightning magic on and the effects of his magic lasted a very long time as we know already and the most important thing about the fence in the whole story was that it worked on people as well but the time has come for the GM's punishment. Yes Man told him that he was going to put the guildmaster into the mines and that he would work as a miner for 5 years if he failed to pay 5 gold coins as bail money. The guildmaster pleaded with Yes Man to change his decision and he thought to himself that if the money was the only thing Yes Man wanted, he could give him some from the deposit money he stole from the guild's warehouse. However, when he looked into his bag, it was completely empty and there was no money to be seen. Yesman explained that he was found unconscious by the fence and he had all the guild's money on him, which was proof enough to label him as a criminal. Yesman held one thing in his hand and that was the Ring of Slavery. He explained how that was the only thing they were going to let the guildmaster keep. Now Yesman opened the box took out the ring and the guildmaster's facial expression changed from that of anger to that of confusion and ultimately to that of being scared to death. Yes Man looked at the ring of slavery and he thought that it would be a perfect fit for the guildmaster's finger. The guildmaster pleaded with Yes Man to stop and as he was tied down there was nothing he could do to resist. He couldn't understand how Yes Man was so cruel that he was going to use the ring of slavery on him but he forgot his previous plan which was the same exact plan he wanted to use the same exact ring on eggs to make him his slave. There was no difference between the guildmaster and butler Yesman, and as the ring was put on the guildmaster's thumb, he immediately felt like he was under extreme pressure and his entire body became a lot heavier. Yesman punished the guildmaster as he saw fit and he told the guards to take him to the mines. And before leaving the scene, Yesman wished the guildmaster all the luck the world had to offer as he was definitely going to need it. The GM couldn't function at all ever since the ring was on his his thumb and he felt extremely cold and sick. He spent the remaining time in his cell yelling for help. The next day Aix was walking down the city streets and he felt his whole body twitch when he heard someone call out his name. When Aix turned around he was greeted by butler Yesman. Some time passed since the two last met and Yesman acted like he wasn't up to date with the whole situation concerning Aix and said that there was a rumor that Aix quit his job as an adventurer 
adventurer for the guild. Our protagonist just nodded his head without feeling the need to explain anything to Yes Man. But Yes Man had something else in mind. There was a rule that once an adventurer had received money for a certain job, even though he quit the guild and wasn't employed, he had to finish the quest without arguing. However, Aix didn't understand what Yes Man talked about as there were no new quests that he had accepted, nor did he take money from anyone for that matter. Aix proudly told Yes Man that he didn't care about the money at all because he made a decision not to work for the Viscount ever again. Yes Man started having some doubts in his mind and our protagonist just kindly excused himself and continued with his walk. Yes Man looked after Aix as he was creating some distance between them and he felt both dumb and angry because it seemed that the guild master tricked him and used him. Yasmin realized that from all the 105 gold coins that were given to the guild master to try and make Aix work again, Aix never saw a single one of them and the greedy GM took all of them for himself. Yasmin was determined to make his life more miserable than ever now. And in the meantime, the guild master was in the mines and there was no time for him to rest as the guards immediately warned him to continue working. The guild master tried to blame the difficulty of the job on the ring of slavery, but the guards couldn't care less that he had it hard. They just told him that the ring would be taken from from his thumb once his five year long sentence was up. The guild master thought to himself that he only needed to endure five years of that struggle, but what he didn't know was that Yes Man found out that he had spent the hundred gold coins as well and that his sentence was about to be extended by a hundred more years, my bro. I, I don't know what to say, man, I wish you all the best. Now, Butler Yesman returned back to the Viscount's mansion and he was immediately called by his master. The Viscount wanted to know whether or not 200 magical items were completed or not. He told Yesman that his meeting with the princess was getting closer and closer and he needed those cooling fans done by then. Yesman approached the Viscount with caution as he didn't want to make him angry and he told the Viscount that only Aix could make such magical tools and as they couldn't get him to work, the Viscount should consider hiring someone else for that job. Now someone laughed behind Yes Man and when he turned around he saw an odd looking guy. The guy proposed to both Yes Man and the Viscount that they should try and kidnap Aix and make him work for them even if he was against it. The guy behind Yes Man was named Urakal. Urakal? U-R-A-C-A-L? Urakal? I don't know. <laughs> and he was the king of the ghetto. When the Viscount heard that idea, he became a lot more invested in the conversation as Yesman's excuses were boring him. Now Yesman realized that while he was away dealing with the guild master and trying to make eggs work for them, Urakal came to the mansion and he probably talked with the Viscount already. Yesman protested and asked the Viscount to think about his decisions because they were now treading through muddy waters. Urakal wasn't going to stop pitching his idea and he said that eggs would be provided with a room in the basement and that he would be treated well and if he wanted his freedom then he was destined to change his mind and it would be just a matter of time. The Viscount's face had a huge grin on it and he thought that Aix was just a commoner and no one would care about him so it should be fine and Yesman realized that his worst fear might actually turn into a reality very soon. The Viscount knew how his reputation would be harmed if he chose to kidnap Aix so he informed Yesman and Urek that they would set something called a honey trap for Aix and that way he would come to them all on his own. The Viscount realized that resorting to crime would be too much, so that's why he decided for a honey trap. Urakal was a bit confused as he didn't know what that term actually meant, but the Viscount explained it. A honey trap was a trap where a person is seduced by a good looking woman and that was basically the whole gist of it. The Viscount liked his idea very much and he told Yesman and Urakal to proceed with its execution. Urakal left the Viscount's office and he was still confused about the honey trap. 
he wasn't confused with the concept of the so-called honey trap, but he was concerned about its execution. The ghetto was filled with all sorts of different criminals, like gangsters, loan sharks, drug dealers, and people that ran the red light district. All of the mentioned criminals excelled in one field, and as Uracle was a gangster himself, he had zero beautiful women at his disposal, and that's what was bugging him. He went to the ghetto and ordered his men to gather some women so he could check them up. Uracle couldn't believe his eyes when he saw what his men had brought in front of him after some time. There was a little girl which was even ill, so she was a definite no. Then they brought an old lady, so she was a no as well, even though the lady felt lively and young at heart, there's no way that they were looking for somebody like her. And next up was a pregnant woman, she was beautiful, but she was just about to give birth, so no help from her as well. They even brought a criminal who wasn't a woman at all, his beard kinda gave him away, and they even brought a cute little dog. I have a feeling they brought literally everyone, except the type of a girl that they needed to bring. So the reason his men brought in the dog was because the dog had a pedigree, like that changed anything. And Uracle was losing his mind because his men were clear dumbasses and none of the people, animals especially, were suitable for the work at hand. Uracle was sure that none of the people, nor the dog, would be able to seduce Aix, even though Uracle knew nothing about Aix. So he frowned, but he thought that he had no other choice as a lady in high heels approached him now. All he could see was the sound of her heels, I mean, here, I mean, ah, you can see the sound, of course, professional recapper, not be, anyways, and she was saying how she would take care of the problem. The women Uracle's men brought in cheered her on and when this woman finally came in front of Uracle, she said that she would just finish that job and she won't do none of these things again. The woman looked like a beauty but there was something between her and Uracle. In fact, she was in love with him. Uracle was happy that she volunteered at first but when he thought about it more, it got harder for him to decide. The woman told Uracle that it was up to him to decide and she would listen to whatever he ordered her to do. So Uracle thought to himself that she was way too nice and that she was more the fall in love type of a woman rather than a seduce me type of a woman. On top of that, Uracle didn't really think that she was extra beautiful and that made him wonder whether she was really suitable for the job. He resorted to his reliable way of deciding between two choices and that was the good old fashioned coin flip. He decided that if the coin lands on the heads, he would let the woman go for it and if it was tails the deal was off. And now he flipped the coin and as the coin was flipping, Uracle hoped that it would be tails after all. And actually this is a psychological trick, a little psychological trick with the coin flip. If you're ever indecisive about something, let's say you have an option A and an option B. You can flip a coin and when it lands on something, if you feel regret, you actually subconsciously wanted the other option instead. And if you feel content with the coin flip, then good for you. Now back to this actual coin flip, when he was about to catch the coin, all the thinking made him lose focus a bit and he missed catching the coin. Uracle felt disappointed with himself for failing to catch the coin as that was his signature move whenever he was in a tight spot. Someone crouched to pick up his coin from the ground while Uracle was busy swiping off sweat from his face. A little girl picked up the coin and told Uracle that he dropped it while she was giving it back to him. He was surprised at first, but after he took a good look at the girl, he shouted that she was the one for the job. Uracle made his decision and the little kid was told to go with the woman that was in love with him. When they came back, the little girl was wearing the woman's dress, but what ended up happening was that the little child wasn't a girl at all. Rather, it was a boy. The boy was completely embarrassed and he thought to himself how he could never be a honey trap, but some men from the ghetto would dare to disagree as they were losing their mind looking at the boy dressed like a girl. Oh my god, what's going on? The woman was clearly dissatisfied with Uracle's decision because she ended up having to lend the boy her best dresses. She told the boy that he should do what was told to him and that she was in charge of his styling. Men were approaching 
approaching the woman like usual, but when they saw the little boy that was dressed up as a girl, they second guessed themselves. People that knew that beneath all the makeup and the clothes was a boy made fun of the people that got debated and even the boy admitted to being a boy and he confirmed all the rumors. Fooling around and tricking people was an enjoyable experience for the boy and he started liking it and he thought to himself that he just might do the job very well and he was ready. After a while, someone had spotted aches and they ran back to the little boy and the woman called Nii-sama and informed them that aches was walking towards them. All three of them, the man that reported seeing aches, the little boy and Nii-sama peeked from behind the house. Nii-sama thought to herself that aches looked like a nobleman and that made her wish to succeed even stronger now, but there was one problem. Aix wasn't walking alone and next to him was Laka, whom Nisama thought was very beautiful. As no one told them that Aix would be in a company of a beautiful young girl, they were surprised and they kept asking themselves who Laka actually was. The way she was so composed and calm made them think that she was out of that world, a devil or something like that. And be it as it may, as they didn't have any further information about Laka, they decided to hold on for the time being. But Nisama thought to herself that there were three of them while Aix and Laka were alone, but she didn't count Laka's teddy bear as another person because she couldn't have possibly known that without a report. She knew they had to try and execute the honey trap now because she didn't know when they would be able to get another chance at luring aches. Nisama was driven solely by her love for Yurakul. She loved him so much that she would do anything he asked of her. However, aches noticed them looking at him and Laka and as they were bigger in number and they looked a bit shady, Laka started getting a bit uncomfortable and Aix knew he had to do something to make her feel safe and protected so he decided to stand in front of her like a human shield. Laka hid herself from being seen by the honey trap group as they finally approached Aix. Our protagonist was ready for whatever the outcome of that encounter was going to be and he asked them what they wanted from him and Laka. Nisama decided that she would be the one in charge of speaking and negotiating so she flirtatiously tried wooing Aigs and asked him whether or not he would be interested in having some fun time with her and the little boy that was dressed up as a girl and even he added a question to make it look a bit more credible. Both Aigs and Laka couldn't believe what just happened and they were left completely speechless. Laka and Aigs kept their mouths shut but someone was speaking and Nisama couldn't understand who it was. It was only then that she saw that Laka was holding a bear in her arms and the bear seemed to be quite angry at them for interrupting Aigs and Laka while they were walking together. The bear told them that their idea was totally wicked and the bear could see through all the makeup and girly clothes and he could tell that the little girl was actually a guy after all. Nisama couldn't believe nor her eyes nor her ears as Lucky Bear talked. The little boy said that he was giving up because they weren't superior when it came to the number of people they were up against and it would be pointless if they tried when the bear found out that he was a boy after all on his first guess. Our protagonist was still a little bit confused and he was waiting for an explanation from anyone. The boy actually blurted everything out and said that they just approached them because their task was to woo Aix and seduce him into a honey trap. The boy realized that their plan was impossible to execute and he apologized to Aix. Our protagonist wasn't really sure what they meant by a honey trap and when he repeated that phrase, the boy told him that he had heard him right and said that the only reason they failed to honey trap Aix was Laka. The little boy even asked Aix if he could pretend that he was indeed honey trapped, would he ever consider going to the Viscount's mansion and having a talk with him. The boy and the man that first noticed Aix that was heading their way tried to explain how he would be treated very well at the Viscount's mansion and that they only tried to talk him into listening to them because they were feeling sad for Nisama. To answer their question, Aix had put himself in that position in his head, but his decision was a rather easy one. Our protagonist simply responded that he wouldn't go to the Viscount's mansion and he had a huge smile on his face. The boy had to inform fuming Nisama that Aix never even thought about doing such a thing. 
Nisama was so furious that she now threatened Aix that sooner or later he was about to be Hari trapped by either her or anyone else for that matter. She proclaimed that they were about to leave and that meant that Nisama had plenty of time to think about other strategies. Aix looked after them while they were walking away and he couldn't fully understand what the hell just happened. But Lucky Bear called out to Aix and told him that they should just focus on the thing they were doing a couple of moments ago. Nisama and the little boy came back to the ghetto and they informed Yurakul about what just happened to them and Yurakul had a huge headache because Aix wasn't on his way to this place. Yurakul listened to the reports from Nisama and from the little boy and he couldn't believe how bad they screwed up. Even though they failed and the little boy told Aix their true intentions, Yurakul didn't blame them not one bit because they didn't know and neither did he that Aix already had someone as beautiful as Laka by his side. Yurakal knew that he couldn't send out the little boy and Nisama again as they would immediately get recognized by Aix and Laka but he didn't have any other choice really. All the people that were brought in by his men have already gone. I mean even if they haven't what would you do with a pregnant lady or an old lady trying to honey trap our protagonist? Oh my god. Anyways, Yurakul thought hard about successfully completing his quest and while he was immersed in his thoughts, he repeated Aik's name a couple of times and someone noticed that. That someone was the little orphan that Aix helped at the beginning of our story, the one with the tail and pointy ears. Yurakul was a bit surprised that he was approached but he thought that the little girl might actually know Aix somehow and the little girl nodded her head in confirmation. Those were great news for Yurakul as he was waiting for someone that was in one way or the other connected to Aix and he told the little girl that she just needed to escort Aix to the Viscount's mansion. Yurakul asked the little girl whether there was anything she wanted in return for her services. The girl actually did have something she wished for and that was medicine for a common cold. That seemed somewhat familiar to Yurakul and he thought that the little girl in front of him might have actually been good friends with the little girl that was brought to him by his men. Yurakul told the little girl that he would obtain the medicine and that she should go and do as she was just told. The girl's face lit up when she heard that she was going to get the medicine she wanted and she turned around in hurry to find Aix and somehow escort him to the mansion. Yurakul was a bit disappointed with himself because he was using a complete stranger for his job and the stranger ended up being a little kid but he thought to himself that he did so because he was slowly losing patience and he wanted the whole situation to end as soon as possible. ASAP, as soon as possible. But when you say as soon as possible, it doesn't sound as bad when you say ASAP. When you say ASAP, it's like, do it, do it immediately. <laughs> Anyways, Yurakal looked very concerned and Nisama approached him now and she told him that she didn't want to have nothing more with the job concerning Aix. Her decision wasn't such because she couldn't act as good bait for a honey trap, but rather she didn't want to keep seeing Yurakal so distressed and worried. And in the meantime, the little girl actually found Aix and they made their way to the Viscount's mansion. Yesman greeted him and asked Aix whether he was finally ready to start working on the quest, but Aix was very, very angry. Our protagonist pointed his hand at the little girl and he told Yesman that it was disgusting that they decided to use such a small child as a bait for a honey trap and even Yesman was completely blown away when he saw the little girl. Yesman tried to reason with Aix to tell him that that was some kind of a mistake but Aix wasn't going to let him do that, the evidence was right in front of his eyes. And our protagonist was even told that the job the Viscount wanted him to do had something to do with an ill child. Yesman was completely shocked by stuff Aix was telling him and he was so angry with Yurakal for choosing this little girl as Aix's honey trap. I mean at least he has some morals. The little girl told Aix that she would do anything for her ill friend and our protagonist couldn't understand how they could use someone so small and so desperate. Aix's stomach felt sick just at the thought of all that and he hated all that were in one way or another involved in that. The Viscount not knowing any of that came to greet Aix as well and he looked really happy to see him. Our protagonist didn't say a thing and yes man just stood there as well. The Viscount uttered the one thing he shouldn't have said and that was that he was certain that Aix would fall for 
his honey trap. The Viscount thought to himself that Aix had no other choice but to listen to him and he told Aix to work for him again. Our protagonist couldn't understand whether or not the Viscount was actually in his right mind, but that wasn't too important. Aix yelled out that he would never work for him and on top of that, he would never forgive him for being such a slimy scumbag. Aix told the Viscount that he would buy the medicine that the little girl wanted for her sick friend and they started to walk away. The Viscount seemed baffled with the way Aegis behaved and he tried to make Aegis stay a bit longer, even if just for a conversation, but our protagonist didn't budge even one bit. In a matter of days, the whole town talked about the incident and everyone heard that the Viscount used the little child as a honey trap and that made his public image as lousy as one can be and his whole reputation was destroyed. Now we see the princess and she used some special magic to find out where Aegis Aix lived and when she saw that he was in a villa at the end of the forest, she decided that she wasn't going to waste any more time and that she was going to meet Aix even if she had to see him all by herself. The Grand Chamberlain went to see his granddaughter but he was greeted by the guards who told him that she had already gone out all alone. The guards were making excuses by saying how there was nothing they could have done as she had already been long gone when they arrived to check in on her and that incident made the Grand Chamberlain think to himself that he might have made a mistake when he asked the princess about her opinion on the magical item that Aix had made. The princess was actually the third daughter, her name was Lala and she was 12 years old which was way younger than her sister. Lala was very smart and kind hearted but one day she brought in a magical item that was given to her as a gift. The Grand Chamberlain asked his granddaughter what it was that she held in her hands and Lala couldn't explain very well what it was, she just knew that cool air came out of it and that the Viscount gave it to her. The Grand Chamberlain asked Lala if she could show it to him and he immediately took that chance to assess the item's danger level. He used a spell called Scout Terra and he found out that the item was basically harmless but he was still suspicious about the whole thing. The Grand Chamberlain was immediately intrigued and he asked Lala if he could borrow one of the items as he had been given to and she let him but warned him that he should pay attention not to break it as it was gift for one of her older sisters. The Grand Chamberlain immediately went to the royal laboratory and he asked Herman, who was a first class engineer that worked there, whether the magical item that Aix made was something completely different from other magical tools and items. The Grand Chamberlain explained how Lala had gotten it as a gift and he was a bit angry at the Viscount for having broken the rules by giving something directly to the princess herself. Herman said that it was possible that the Viscount wasn't aware of such a rule because he just recently became a noble and Herman admitted that it was the first time he heard about such a rule himself. Herman took Aix's invention and the first thing he noticed was that the item was extra light. So he asked the Grand Chamberlain whether he had the permission to take it apart and the Grand Chamberlain told him that that won't be a good idea as Lala would get really mad at him. Herman stared at the magical tool that Aix had made and he had a million questions in his head. He couldn't quite understand the concept behind behind the whole thing as he could see small block of ice in the tube but that didn't explain where the cool breeze was coming from. He hadn't found anything unusual with the tube but he thought to himself that the tube itself was the magic stone that was just cut out and shaped into a tube. He couldn't quite wrap his head around the cooling fan and he thought that it could be possible that it was either the work of a devil or a very very special item. Herman moved the fan around and he couldn't hear anything inside it and he was rather surprised by that fact. The Grand Chamberlain saw that Herman was acting strange and the very next moment Herman yelled out that the tube was completely empty. He couldn't come to terms with the fact as there definitely had to be something inside that generated cool air and something that would distribute it but the tube was completely empty and Herman wanted to know how that was possible. The Grand Chamberlain thought that Herman was looking at the engravings which were missing and he tried to tell Herman 
Herman that not all things end up engraved, but that wasn't what concerned Herman. He couldn't understand how the whole thing functioned without a formula and without a source of magic, something like a magic stone or something similar. Herman told the Grand Chamberlain that the magical tool in front of them surely wasn't from their world and Herman could never have imagined that someone would fuse a beginner ice ball and wind magic in one item and thus make something so great like the magical tube in front of him. The Grand Chamberlain grew a bit concerned when he heard what Herman told him and he knew that he would have to find out who Aix was and he didn't have much time. Currently, he didn't have any means to contact Aix and that made him even more worried. Lala had her explanation of the magical tube and she thought that Aix must have used very simple magic and the catch was that the magic lasted for an unusual amount of time for some reason. Lala didn't know who Aix was but having seen the cooling fan she knew that he was a great magician. The Grand Chamberlain didn't agree with his granddaughter and he thought that even if that was the case no magician would use such advanced techniques for a magical item that more resembled a toy than anything else. Lala's explanation for that was that there was probably someone who asked the magician to make such an item and the Grand Chamberlain didn't have more strength to talk about the matter and he asked Lala to forget about that for a while while they ate dinner. Lala was happy with that proposition and she was impatiently waiting to gift one of the two magical tubes she had to her sister with the hopes that she would like it. And after the dinner, the Grand Chamberlain decided to launch a full investigation about who Aix was as there was a possibility that he was one of the best mages there ever was. But nothing seemed more interesting about Aix than the fact that he had no desires nor aspirations to actually work. The Grand Chamberlain talked with his granddaughter Lala as he wanted to hear her opinion about Aix and what she thought of him not wanting to work. Lala said that no one could know why Aix wasn't working but he himself and therefore Lala thought that it would be best if they went and visited him in person. The Grand Chamberlain thought to himself that Lala might just be right and that there actually was no other choice but to meet Aix in person. However, what ended up happening was that Lala went to meet Aix without her grandpa and he had other thoughts as he wanted them to go together. In the meantime, Princess Lala was already somewhere near Aix's house and she even managed to change her clothes at the villa. She didn't have to walk for too long before she saw Aix. Our protagonist stood there with a skewer in his hand and he kept looking around himself. The princess called out to him and as he turned his head her way, she asked him what he was up to. Aix was a bit surprised but he replied that he was looking for someone or something to give his skewer to because he couldn't finish it like before. Lala told Aix if that was the case, she was going to help help him look for someone who would be willing to take the skewer. Aix was now completely confused because he had never seen Lala in person, he didn't know who she was and yet on their first encounter she was helping him. He stood there and watched her hurry along the street in search of someone who would gladly take his skewer and in no time she called out to Aix that she had found a perfect client that would gladly take his skewer. But what she found wasn't a person, it was actually a better thing than a person. It was a cat that slept on a nearby box. Lala was astonished to see a cat, but the cat actually wasn't what Aix was looking for. He looked for the little girl that he gave his first skewer to, but Lala was certain that the cat would gladly eat them as well. They woke up the cat and they offered her to try the skewers but she just glanced at them and it was obvious that the cat wasn't interested in trying them out and she just went back to sleep. Lala and Aix both laughed as they realized that the cat wasn't even mildly interested. Aix was just about to tell Lala that he was looking for a homeless little girl and she appeared behind them. We find out that her name was Nitra and Aix was quick to offer her his skewers. Nitra was surprised surprised that Aix was giving her the skewer once again and she was thankful for the fact that he was feeding her and that he even offered her medicine for her sick friend Lei. Aix told her that she shouldn't think much about that and Lala was happy that he found the person he was looking for. She was now sure that Aix was indeed Aix and as Aix waved Nitra goodbye, Lala kept looking at him. 
Our protagonist thought to himself that Lala probably thought that he was an odd guy because he gave his cure to a little girl, even though he himself was unemployed and it was hard for him to afford this cure. So he felt uncomfortable being looked at and he turned around and tried to escape by telling Lala that he found the little girl he was looking for, he gave her the skewer and all, and before he could say anything else, Lala interrupted him. She asked him whether or not there was any chance that he was the Aix she was looking for, the great magician Aix. Our protagonist was feeling like he was in the spotlight and he didn't particularly like that, so he told her that he was rather known as a defective mage instead of a great one. Lala was surprised and she apologized and she told Aix that he shared the same name as the great magician she was looking for. Lala reached inside of her bag and took out the magical tool that Aix had invented some time ago and she was looking for the person that made it so she could have the same thing made for herself. Our protagonist immediately recognized the magical item as it was exactly the same as the one he made at the Viscount's request. Aix asked Lala whether he could take the item so he could take a better look at it and once she gave it to him he was a hundred percent sure that that was the very magical item he created for the Viscount. Aix told Lala that he could make the exact same thing and if she wanted to he could make one for her. Lala reached inside her bag once again and she took out two tubes that looked very luxurious. She asked Aix whether he could make them do the exact same thing as the magical item and our protagonist said that that won't be a problem. Lala realized that Aix was indeed the person she was looking for, the great magician, and her eyes sparkled with happiness and she told Aix that she was happy they met. Our protagonist took the two tubes and while he was getting ready to cast his magic, he told Lala that he wasn't as great a magician as she had thought because he could only use the most basic spells out there. Aix didn't want to turn Lala down because she was rather enthusiastic about meeting him and as he hovered his hand over the two tubes, tubes, a flickering light could be seen. Our protagonist used his wind magic and his ice ball spell and afterwards he sealed off the two tubes and Lala was speechless while she observed Aix perform his magic. He handed the finished products to Lala and he asked her not to tell anyone anything about him being a great magician because he loves staying under the radar. Lala brought one of the tubes towards her face and she felt the same cold breeze coming out of it again. She was very very happy and satisfied and she thanked Aix for making the tubes and our protagonist laughed together with her. He was happy because even for just a brief moment, he was deemed a great magician and he didn't mind that coming from a little girl. Aix had one more thing to ask of Lala and that was to keep silent about the fact that he had been feeding Nitra and the least Lala could do was to keep her promise. Lala went back home and as soon as she entered the villa, the Grand Chamberlain scolded her because she left without taking permission from him. The Grand Chamberlain was very very angry but that anger only came from the fact that he was worried about his granddaughter. However his face changed when Lala offered him a present in form of a magical tube. The Grand Chamberlain didn't recognize them and that meant that they were brand new even though the functions were the same on those magical items. Lala interrupted his train of thoughts and she said that there was something that bugged her for some time now. She wanted to repay aches in some way as a thank you for making the cooling tubes and the Grand Chamberlain also took that very seriously as he was the head of the royal family and he couldn't possibly allow himself nor his family to be indebted to someone and he also felt the need to thank Aix for his hard work and to congratulate him on his very rare set of skills. In the next couple of days Aix experienced some problems two of them actually. The first problem was that he was constantly greeted by different people that were dressed in fancy clothing and they all seemed to have the same thing to tell him and that was to invite him to a dinner party that was supposedly organized by a noble. As Aix didn't know what the whole thing was about, he always declined the invitations as he couldn't risk anything. However, the other problem that he kept experiencing much more as time passed by was that he was slowly but surely running out of money. Even though that might have been the case, our protagonist kept eating at the restaurant and he always ordered a special meal which was on sale that day. He thought to himself that he mustn't let himself go back to the times where all he ever ate was Jerome's slime food. 
Aix wasn't very good at saving money and he even ordered juice after finishing his special meal. He had very little money left, but in contrast to that, his bed was filled with slime pillows. Five of them actually, which meant that Aix had been sleeping rather peacefully if I might say so myself. And the last thing that Aix owned was a special warm stone that had a special fire enchantment. Our protagonist was practically without a choice. He knew perfectly well that he didn't want to work but the reality was that he really needed the money to keep living normally. And Aix thought about all the possible things that he could do and he finally came up with an idea. His idea was rather rash and not thoroughly thought through. He decided that if push came to shove, he would spend his time gambling with the hopes of winning a jackpot. When I say that Aix really thought gambling, I really meant it. He said that there was an odd shop in one of the back alleys called the Dragon Sword. That shop held multiple raffles in the last couple of months and even though our protagonist wasn't a very lucky person he thought to himself that he would be able to win the raffle if he kept to his secret plan. Aix thought to himself that the organizers would try to buy as much time as possible so if there were any mages that used certain buffs to increase their luck there would be enough time for their buffs to wear off but that was where Aix would shine. Normally buffs lasted for 10 minutes and that was it, but we all know that Aix's magic was a lot more durable and because of that, he would have a bit of an unfair advantage. However, our protagonist didn't care about it being fair or unfair, he just wanted to win himself some money. That was the best thing Aix could have thought of, but on a second thought, he didn't like the idea of gambling very much. Aix walked down the street and he thought how he could earn himself some money and Nitra creeped up behind him and she scared him to death when she told him that she was looking for him. Our protagonist collected himself and he asked her about her friend and whether or not she was recovering from the medicine he gave her. Nitra said that her friend Ray was feeling much better thanks to Aix and to show her gratitude, Ray was willing to serve Aix and Aix told it was a bit strange for the little girls to call him master. Okay, here comes the harem now. Our protagonist remembered how he got the medicine from a local witch and he thought that she might have put some other herbs on top of a medicinal ones that Aix was originally looking for. He told Nitra that Ray shouldn't worry herself with helping Aix or even serving him at that matter because he also had people that helped him and doing that for Ray felt like he was returning the favor that was done for him. Nitra understood what Aix was saying and while she looked at him, Aix reached into his inner pocket for his money pouch because he wanted to treat Nitra to some food. But when Aix took his money pouch from the pocket, he felt the pouch became ever slightly thinner and lighter. He felt very bad because of that and Nitra realized that he was low on money. Her first thought was that Aix lacked money because he paid for Ray's medicine and that was actually true, but our protagonist couldn't allow himself to tell that to a young kid. Ray wasn't just suffering from a normal cold, she was suffering from my dog barking in the background. What she had was something called the curse of Farah, and to cure that curse, the cursed person needed some elf's elixir, which was indeed very, very expensive, and that was one of the reasons why Aix was low on money at the moment. But Aix put on a smile and told Nitra that buying medicine for her friend Ray wasn't the reason he was in need of money, and he even ended up giving Nitra the last money pouch he had, and our protagonist told her to take it and use the money to buy her friend something nice. Because Aix needed Nitra not to suspect anything, he reassured her that he was only giving her money because he had a lot more stashed somewhere and it wasn't on him and that made perfect sense to Nitra. Now, Aix kindly laughed but in reality he didn't have a single penny left but he felt happy for helping out some orphans. Nitra felt extremely grateful to Aix and she hugged him and purred from happiness. When Nitra left, our protagonist walked some more to clear out his thoughts. He thought about his next course of action because he didn't have any money and he knew that he was either going to depend on Laka or that he would have to start working as a security guard in Lena's store. But before anything he needed to eat something as he was rather hungry. Even though his pockets were empty when it came to money, his heart and soul were very warm because he was able to do a good deed and help the orphaned girls. Aix reached into his pocket and he thought about the special warm stone that he had with him. 
there was a possibility that the stone might be sold to some rich people who only wanted some entertainment. And just as Aix was thinking about all of his options, another one of the people dressed in fancy clothes came to ask him whether he thought about joining the dinner party. The man came at the right moment and that time Aix actually accepted the invitation as he really didn't have anything to eat nor he could afford anything else because he was completely broke. In the meantime, the princess Lala was enjoying her cup of tea in her family's villa and she was happy that the guard did such a good job and that they were about to have Aix come to their dinner party. Lala was enjoying her tea and fantasizing about meeting Aix once again when her sister Shiron who was the second princess of the Whitening Kingdom and who was a spitting image of Lala came to greet Lala. Sharon told her sister that she would love if she could meet with the person who made the cooling tubes and that was proof enough that she liked them very much. However, Sharon, is it Sharon or Chiron? Chiron. I'll call her Chiron. However, Chiron only said that so she could be invited to the dinner party as well, but in fact she was very concerned about the safety of her younger sister. Lala was so innocent that she suspected nothing and told Chiron that she would- Chiron. Ah, I'm getting confused by this name. Why am I getting confused by this name? <laughs> she told Chiron that she would introduce them to each other. But Chiron knew how fragile Lala was and that's why she wanted to protect her from anyone and everyone. She thought that it was suspicious that Aix kept turning down their invitations and now everything was completely different as Aix accepted their invitation for the first time ever. Chiron heard that Aix had some very unusual magical conditions and she also thought that every mage was an eccentric and she was only wary because she needed to watch over her younger sister. Chiron asked the Grand Chamberlain whether she could also attend the dinner and the Grand Chamberlain was a bit surprised by the fact that Chiron was the one that asked him that because she wasn't so social before. Her grandpa said that there would be no problems if she came but he wanted to warn her about about certain stuff. Chiron grew even more intrigued by the whole setup and she asked her grandpa to tell her what that stuff was. The Grand Chamberlain explained that she must be very polite over the table and that she needed to refrain from using the word work. Chiron couldn't understand this condition but her grandpa explained everything to her leaving nothing to doubt. Lala heard their conversation and she decided that she would try to explain to her sister that Aix didn't want to work another day in his life. Chiron heard that and she couldn't understand how a mage didn't want to work and on top of that she couldn't imagine such a life. I mean, you're a princess, are you sure you can't imagine a life without working? <laughs> Chiron thought that what Aix had decided was rather selfish as she thought that everyone had a role they needed to play and they weren't allowed to quit when things got hard. Chiron felt like she was trapped as well but she was able to manage her emotions and keep them under control. The Grand Chamberlain added a couple of more sentences and questions about work that were all forbidden at the dinner party while our protagonist was there. The reason for that was that they only wanted to make a new friend and to feel free around each other. Chiron acted like she was going to listen to her grandpa's orders but Lala saw her face which had a vague smile on it. As Aix had decided to finally accept the invitation from the fancy looking people, he was sitting in the carriage now and he wondered where it was that they were taking him and he could feel his heart thumping loudly because he didn't even think in his wildest dreams that they would pick him up in such an amazing carriage. Aix felt so grateful that he bowed his head down and thanked the person that was seated across him but the person got all confused and explained how he was just a guide and he was only only sent to invite him. Hearing that brought ugly memories to Aix as he never had a decent experience with the noble and he thought about leaving the carriage just in that moment. They came in front of the secret cat cafe where Aix drank coffee with Laka and Lucky Bear and Aix felt relieved that they arrived there and not some fancy looking mansion. When Aix said that he had been there before, the guide laughed and he explained to Aix that he was unaware of the fact that Aix knew about a very special secret path and the guide 
also said that Aix was potentially a noble or had been one before. Aix couldn't quite understand what the guide was talking about, but the only words stuck in his head were secret path. They entered the cafe and the guide opened something on the floor and showed a path that looked like it led into a dungeon. Our protagonist went down the stairs together with the guide and the guide had a very interesting looking key that he used to open a fancy door. The door creaked and the guy showed something that looked like a portal. He said that that was where they would have to part ways as his job was to bring Aix to the portal. Our protagonist stood there and his mind was completely bent. The guide asked him whether everything was okay and Aix couldn't accept the fact that there was a so-called transfer gate in the cafe which in itself was a place to hide from unwanted attention. While Aix was immersed in his thoughts, the guide walked back behind him and with a smile on his face, he told Aix that he would be late if he hesitated that much and he pushed him into the transfer gate. Aix wasn't expecting to be pushed and thrown into the transfer gate as that was his first time ever using one of them and he thought to himself that he would be able to carefully inspect everything and enter at his own free will. While his body was sinking into the transfer gate, he thought about telling all of this to Laka and to Lucky Bear but he also thought about never forgetting giving the guide for pushing him inside. When Aix completely passed through the portal, he found himself on the floor in what looked like a noble's mansion and he was greeted by an army of butlers and maids. Aix felt a bit embarrassed for having fell but the servants showed him the way without laughing at him for falling down. Aix started walking but he turned around to see whether there was a transfer gate behind him but all he could see was a normal wall and that kinda surprised him. Our protagonist thought to himself how he only thought about food when he was invited to a dinner party and he wasn't expecting something like that to ever happen. One of the maids opened the door for him and our protagonist was taken into a huge dining room. When he entered, Aix immediately saw the girl that he made those cooling tubes for and apart from her, two more people were there as well, another girl that looked like the little one and an old man. When Aix entered the room, Lala's eyes brightened up as she was really happy to see him. When she called Aix a great magician, all the doubts that he might have had up until that point were completely discarded. Aix thanked the old man for having him, but the old man said that he was just a butler and he needn't thank him. As Chiron was the oldest noble in the room, she stood up from her chair and thanked Aix for coming. Afterwards she introduced herself and her younger sister Lala to Aix and she kindly asked him to sit across them. Our protagonist tried to explain that he wasn't as great as they thought and in reality everyone actually called him a defective mage. But Chiron showed him the cooling tube he had previously made and told him that if he was capable of creating such magical items he was nothing less than great. Lala said that they should start eating dinner as they had finished with their greetings and formalities. The butlers brought in soup and served the table and Chiron was waiting for the moment as she wanted to see how Aix behaved at the table as there were manners and etiquette that needed to be followed. Aix thought that the soup looked amazingly delicious and he was having doubts about which spoon to use as there were many different sizes and shapes and he thought to himself that he should go for the biggest one. He grabbed some of the soup with his spoon and when he tried it he was overwhelmed with how tasty it was. Even though the biggest spoon was a little bit too heavy to hold and it made it a bit difficult to eat with, he couldn't think about that because the soup was extremely delicious. Chiron followed all of Aix's movements and because he deliberately used the biggest spoon, she thought that there might be something wrong. Our protagonist ate a bit and then he asked Chiron and Laka whether the dinner was just for the three of them or whether their parents would join them as well. Chiron felt like someone had pierced her with a knife and the grand chamberlain that stood behind her and posed as a butler was surprised as well that Aix wanted to have a word with the king himself. Lala explained that her father was a very busy man and Aix felt sorry for her. They continued to eat and Lala showed Aix which spoon he should use for the soup and he thanked her for teaching him. Chiron couldn't decide whether that question was just Aix casually talking or whether he had some ulterior motives. After they ate the soup, the plates were taken back into the kitchen and the main dish was served. The main 
dish was a respectable portion of beef that was swimming in a glazing sauce with some butter on top. And while the dish made some sizzling noise as it was still fresh and hot, Aix just looked at it from distance. The Grand Chamberlain leaned in towards Chiron and they commented Aix not touching the meal at all. Chiron was immersed in her thoughts and she thought to herself that by not wanting to eat, Aix was rejecting any possible relations with them and she wondered what it was that she did wrong. Aix couldn't even look at the meal as it looked so tasty and tempting because his stomach was completely full just from the soup they just ate. Our protagonist blamed it all on a small piece of bread he ate before coming there. Aix just stood there in his chair with his arms crossed while Chiron and the Grand Chamberlain observed his every single move. The Grand Chamberlain finally decided to speak out and he asked Aix whether he needed any help with the meal, but Aix was at first very surprised. He responded how there were no problems, but then he remembered that he wanted to ask them something. He stood up and reached for his jacket to take something out of his pockets and he took a bunch of stones and laid them across the dining table. Chiron and the Grand Chamberlain couldn't believe that he had so many of them and Aix told them that those warm stones would be of great help during winter. He explained that those stones were in fact very normal stones on which he had used some of his fire magic. Because his magic lasted for long periods of time, using just a bare minimum would keep the stones warm for god knows how long. Aix thought to himself that the stones didn't have a very good price, but he wanted to sell them so he could earn himself some money. And he went to Laka for help and asked her what did she do when she struggled to determine the price of her products. Laka told him that it was best to let the buyers decide the price because that was the easiest way of making a deal. Aix thought to himself that he would try out Laka's tactics and he told Chiron that he would give them some time to think about how much they were willing to pay for them. Our protagonist stood up from his chair and went to have a small walk through the hallway. Lala asked her grandpa if they could buy all of those warm stones at the price of one gold coin and Chiron told her that she was out of her mind and that they were only getting one of them at that price. The Grand Chamberlain thought about the fact that Aix didn't want to work anymore and Chiron had all sorts of ideas going through her head and she couldn't decide what was right and what was wrong. Lala thought it would be good if they asked him what he thought about what the price should be and Chiron thought that that idea was really great because then they would see his true face. But Lala wasn't concerned, she believed in Aix as she saw him feeding a little orphaned girl. In the meantime as Aix was walking back to the dining room, he thought to himself that 7 small silver coins would be a fair price for one of the warm stones and if he was being extra greedy he would make it one large silver coin as they were obviously very rich. Aix entered the dining room and he was blown away by the sight in front of him. The girls were seated and the old man stood behind them but the table was filled with stacks of coins and everything was giga shiny. Aix thought to himself that they must be bragging about the amount of money they have and he thought it would be completely fine if he asked for a large silver coin. Lala told Aix that it was him who needed to decide how much he wanted for the warm stones and he could take as many coins as he wanted. Aix was really surprised with that statement as all the coins in front of him were golden ones and Chiron assured him that there was nothing wrong and that he could really take as much as he wanted. Aix took some time to think about his situation as he thought that in the best scenario he would end up with one large silver coin and now he was offered to take as many gold coins as he wanted. He ended up thinking that that was some kind of a test and that he needed to choose real coins from fake ones. He thought he had figured it all out but Chiron was certain that he didn't have a clue what was going on. Aix took two coins and because he couldn't use appraisal magic he tried to weigh the coins with his hands but he soon found out that there were no differences whatsoever between them. Lala looked at him with a very strange face and Aix mustered up some courage and told them that he would be taking one gold coin as payment for the warm stones. The room was filled with silence and no one said anything. 
That made AX think that he said something completely wrong and Lala couldn't hold her excitement anymore and she blurted out how she knew that he was a kind person and that made AX happy as he made the right choice. That was a test to see the real reason behind AX not wanting to work and Chiron realized it was because AX was rather selfless. After AX had passed the test set up by the Grand Chamberlain and Chiron, it was time for the dessert. For dessert they were served something that looked like tiramisu, it looked very tasty and AX thought to himself that a dessert was a good reward after racking his brains to choose between so many gold coins and even though he was almost full, AX seemed to be one of those people who always had some space for dessert. And now that they were all a bit more relaxed, Chiron asked Aix to explain his magic and his contract with the Hollow Realm. Aix responded very simply and explained that he wished for his magic to last for a long time and it proved itself quite useful in many situations and to obtain that he needed to sacrifice learning advanced magic and was only able to use the most simplest of spells. Chiron couldn't understand how hard it must have been for him for having to sacrifice something like that and Aix explained that even after his contract he tried learning some advanced magic but as it was too difficult and he saw no progress he chose to give up on it. Chiron thought to herself that Aix was trying to live life outside of his comfort zone whereas she always felt like she was caged behind bars in the royal mansion. Maybe she should try the discomfort of something which wasn't associated with the royals. Chiron wanted to know whether or not Aix regretted his decision and when she asked him that, Aix told her that his magic had proved useful many times and because of that and because of the reason that that was the way he chose, he never regretted anything. On top of that, Aix added that he did try learning advanced magic but he thought that he wasn't just cut out for that and that's why he became someone who mastered their own incompetence as he put it out. Chiron saw how brave Aix was for choosing to give away all the benefits he had and she compared her situation with him. She was about to marry someone on the orders of someone else and she always thought that that was just her fate and that there wasn't anything she could do about it. But now seeing what Aix had done with his situation and his life, she started thinking about attaining freedom and giving up some of her benefits. Lala was silent enough and she got up from her chair and she proclaimed very loudly and clearly that she, Lala Whitenin, thought of Aix as a great magician and she asked him not to call himself defective nor incompetent ever again. Those words were so unexpected and they made Aix very surprised but after the initial shock Aix was very happy when his mind processed what she just told him. They finished their meals and their time together was coming to an end for the time being. Our protagonist stood up from the dining table and put his coat on and before leaving he thanked Lala for inviting him over and for serving him a tasty and delicious dinner and Lala told him that they all had a wonderful time and she added that she would take great care of the warm stone that they ended up buying from Aix. Lala said her goodbye and asked Aix to play with him again and Aix didn't have anything against that idea. He went through the transfer gate and when he arrived he wanted to have a word or two with the guard that pushed him inside and tell him how rude that actually was but sadly the guide wasn't there anymore. But before anything else, Aix remembered the gold coin he had received and he wanted to exchange it for 10 silver coins. When he pawned it, he thought to himself that it better be real or else he was totally screwed. While he was waiting for the verdict, his heart was racing and he felt very nervous. In the meantime, at the royal mansion, a maid came to clean the dining table but the table was filled with gold and she asked the Grand Chamberlain what she should should do with it. The Grand Chamberlain didn't say a thing because Lala asked him for a favor. That favor had something to do with Aix and him receiving all of that gold in a way in which he would never suspect anything. On top of that, Aix, who was totally unaware of what had just happened when Lala publicly proclaimed that she recognized him as a great magician, didn't know anything about the significance of that event. Aix understood Lala's compliment just as something a child would say when they loved someone, but it had a much stronger meaning 
meaning than that. When Lala publicly proclaimed that Aix was a great magician, he was officially recognized by the royal family as one of the best mages in history and his name could be found in the biggest register of mages and magicians called the Magician's Hermitage. In the book, Aix was deemed Aix of the Extension, which described his power and he was currently number 9 on the list of the best magicians. However, something or someone had found that out and they immediately grew more interested and intrigued in the magician called Aix, who was our protagonist. The Magician's Hermitage was also the name of an organization that had an equivalent role to the role of the Adventurer's Guild. And while Aix was completely unaware that they exist, his name was being mentioned quite a lot. The mages had seen his name appear on the nominated list and what caught their eyes was the fact that said that he was all already retired and they had never heard his name before. Everyone wondered who was Aix and how was he number 9 on the list of all time greats. The three mages in the magician's hermitage talked between themselves and they came to a conclusion that no one knew who Aix was as they had never heard of him nor his feats before. They had a million questions in their head about him and they even thought that he might have been an illegitimate son of the royal family or that he was in one way or the other related to them. The mages were completely intrigued by the mysterious mage who was our protagonist and they thought that the princess had a slip of the tongue when she recognized him as a great magician. One of the mages had went through the entire mage register and she couldn't find our protagonist anywhere. When she finished, she was ordered to go through the register once again in case she skipped some pages, but while she was at it, a mage called Kakul, who was leading the investigation crew at the Magic's Hermitage, came and said that she would launch an investigation and find all the info she could about Aix. She raised her hand and it was evident that she had already cast some kind of spells as a fiery bird was hovering above her hand. She ordered the bird to find any little piece of information it could find about our protagonist and his current organization. However, after a brief moment, the bird simply responded how there was no such information available. That made Kakul remember that Aix was already retired and then she ordered the bird to search everything for the information about his previous organization and the bird came back with the results. This bird is basically Google Chrome. You know, just, you know, magical version. <laughs> now, the bird told everyone that Aix was working for the Adventurer's Guild and that he was an E rank among their employees. And on top of that, he was even called the Defective Mage. The head of the Magician's Hermitage thought that that was very strange because magicians weren't usually joining Adventurer's Guild. But Kakul was being careful and she told him that that might have been his cover-up story and that she would do another search which would probably reveal who Aix truly was. Kakul once again ordered her bird or basically Google searched to find out everything that was available about Aix even before his time at the Adventurer's Guild and when the bird came back everyone was shocked. The bird proclaimed that Aix had been a D-ranked magician at the very same Adventurer's Guild and that only meant that he had gotten demoted. Now Aix was a complete mystery and he managed to cause such a ruckus in the magician's hermitage. All of the mages that were present when the bird spoke out the information regarding Aix, couldn't believe that someone like Aix could ever be a great magician. And after some time, they thought that Aix had cast maybe some kind of a spell that would hide his information from others, and they thought that he was just playing games with all of them. They tried casting a series of spells to try and counter the magic that Aix hadn't even used in the first place, and the mages were disheartened when they realized that nothing seemed to work, and Aix was still a complete mystery to them. The headmaster and Kakul were dead tired from trying out different spells and they wanted to know why nothing worked. They thought that Aix must have done something extraordinary which was unknown even to them and that rendered them helpless. But as we know, my bro hadn't done anything. <laughs> the reason why Aix wasn't registered in the magician's hermitage was very simple. He never had a formal magic education and he had learned magic from high elves deep within the red forest. That didn't mean that Aix hadn't tried to enter the magician's hermitage, but he was made fun of and was ultimately rejected because of the proposition of his contract and because he was unable to use advanced magic. The magician's hermitage at that time told Aix that he should try the adventurer's guild 
field and they said that that should suit him well. Lala was the one who nominated Aix for the title of a great magician and with that she had him registered in the magician's hermitage without him having to do anything. The Grand Chamberlain thought to himself and he even told Lala that all the mages must have been rather surprised and shocked to see someone who was completely unknown to them appear on the list of the all time greats. And in the meantime, our protagonist was sitting in a restaurant and he suddenly started sneezing. You know how some people say if there's somebody thinking about you then you sneeze. Maybe this is what's happening here. Anyways, once he regained his composure, he overheard people talking about a great magician that was recently registered into the magician's hermitage. No one knew how it happened and the rumor has it that the magician was so great and mysterious that he even set up traps that would make it impossible for anyone to trace him. People commented how that was such a cool way to show your strength and superiority and one of them actually said how 10 years had passed since the last time someone was at Admitted onto that list. Aix thought to himself what he would do after he finished eating his breakfast and the people around him tried to remember the magician's name and one of them said that it was Aix and the other one thought that it was Ayyaix. I don't know how to pronounce them, it's same thing man. At first Aix couldn't really process what he had just heard and a moment later he almost choked when he understood that they were actually talking about him. He hit himself on the chest and drank some water so he could swallow the food that was stuck in his throat. But then again after successfully remaining alive he thought to himself how his name and the name of the great magician that was registered into the magician's hermitage were quite similar and he still had some hope that they weren't talking about him. He remembered how the magician's hermitage turned him down at the entrance and he never even set foot inside. Our protagonist wanted to clear his head from those thoughts so he decided that he would take a walk and during that walk he would decide what he would do later on. Aix loved taking walks because they calmed him down and they allowed him to see things which were out of sight for busy people and he considered his options now. One of them was going to Laka's workshop and playing with her and Lucky Bear. The second one was trying to find something he could buy for Nitra and Ray because Ray loved playing with him as she was delighted when they went fishing and they dug up some treasure. But Aix had decided that he would go see Laka as he hadn't seen her in a while. But while he walked, he stumbled upon Lina and her mother. Lina was very happy to see him and Aix also had a smile on his face and he made a joke about the meeting now being a matter of fate. Lina's mother told Aix how she was just going to open her store for the day and she invited him to try out some cloud candy that he wished to try out but Aix had to refuse her invitation because he already made up his mind. The lady that owned the store told Aix how they just passed by a junkie woman that kept searching for Aix all over town and she thought that Aix Aix might have been in trouble so she let him know. Aix didn't know who she was talking about and he asked her whether the girl had a stuffed animal by her side thinking about Laka but the lady told him that there was no stuffed animals and it wasn't a girl it was actually an adult woman. Lina was oblivious of the whole thing and she asked Aix whether he had been cheating on her even though they weren't in a relationship which made him even more uncomfortable. But Lina and her mother had to go to open the store so they said their goodbyes to Aix and he waved back at them. And our protagonist couldn't believe that there was actually somebody of that description that looked for him all over the place. So he continued walking and hoping that he won't stumble across such a person but he did end up coming across someone. It was the researcher lady whose stats Aix buffed with his support one spell and she stormed off to finish her research. When she saw Aix she was delighted to have finally found him. At first Aix couldn't remember her at all and he wrecked his head to try and find out where he had seen her. He thought to himself that her eyes were in terrible condition and that she looked like she was in a rather bad condition. Just when Aix finally remembered that he used his magic on her because she was eager to help him when no one was around, she came to him and by grabbing him by the shoulder said that she needed him to use his buffing magic on her once again. Having a closer look at her eyes, Aix saw that she was lacking some good quality rest and he thought to himself that his spell might have done more bad than good and he told the lady that he won't use his spell 
spell again until she took some time off. She was willing to pay as much as Aix wanted because she had had a revelation concerning her research and she needed to feel as lively as she was while she was buffed by our protagonist spell. The people walking by were looking strangely at the two of them and no one could really tell what was happening. But their conversation was quite interesting to everyone but Aix thought to himself how he didn't want to be bothered by such things as a research. The lady placed her hand on his chest and she said that after Aix used his thing on her, she had tried countless other things from other people but none seemed to be better than his thing and it made her feel special. I mean, you know what she's talking about but if you don't know what she's talking about, you're gonna think she's talking about something else. Now, she thought that even if money didn't work, she would use her body and by that she meant her opai to pay for Aik's special thing. Our protagonist felt extremely uncomfortable and while he was trying to escape, someone called out to the research lady and told her to back off a bit. And it was none other than the S rank adventurer Marla. Both the research lady and Aix were surprised to see her and Aix thought to himself that there was a possibility that she was there to help him but after she spoke his hopes were completely crushed. Marla said that it's going to be her who is going to take Aix's thing and the whole situation got even worse because now there were two women fighting over Aix's special thing. Aix couldn't believe that that was happening to him but the research lady wasn't backing off and she said that Aix was only hers. Marla wasn't there to have a chit chat and she immediately used one of her spells to move the research lady away from our protagonist. She used her shadow bind spell and trapped the lady and restricted her from moving. Aix thought to himself how that would be the best moment for him to try and escape and he made a run for it but Marla trapped his hand as well with her binding spell. As she pulled Aix's hand, his running direction changed and he ran headfirst into her opai. The first thing that occurred to Aix was how her opai were even softer than all the slime pillows he had at home and he realized it was actually false advertising. He felt like he was in heaven but the feeling didn't last very long as he had fallen unconscious. I mean, is there a better way to go out? Now, after some time, when he came around, he woke up and opened his eyes and he could see the ceiling which meant that he was in someone's bed. When he looked around himself, he saw Marla and the research lady looking after him and as soon as they saw him awake, they immediately asked to buff them. Marla wanted it for herself and the research lady wanted it for herself. Our protagonist simply refused and he didn't know where he was because he couldn't recognize the inn. The research lady asked Aix to hear her out first and then he could decide whether or not he was going to buff her up and Aix thought that to be very reasonable. The lady finally introduced herself and her name was Sarah and she said how she was a mage that was doing research on the structure of barriers but not long ago she was caught by a ghost of an old lady. Aix never heard about ghosts and he thought that Sarah might have seen this ghost lady due to her lack of sleep. But Sarah was certain that she had seen a four fortune telling witch whose body was basically non-existent because everywhere she could see she was completely shrouded by the hollowness. The witch told her how she could see the future and said that she had been living for a thousand years and what she wanted the most was to become immortal. Sarah told Aix everything they talked about and how the witch told her that the city's barriers were long gone and that she had only three options. Those options were either putting up a new barrier or something to do with lightning which Sarah didn't understand or that she informed the forest guards about that so they could have a look. But the witch also told her that the solution to all of her problems was Aix's support one spell. And before the witch left Sarah she told her that if she chose to forget their encounter her happiness would become a thing of past. Aix carefully listened to Sarah and he thought that his magic he used to enhance the fence had worn off which didn't make him all too happy. He used his buffing magic on Sarah and she immediately felt a lot better. She's looking like a fiend, a junkie. She thanked him and she wanted to know why he refused to use his magic when she first asked him to and Aix didn't feel like explaining his reasons to her. 
Marla was still in the room, however, and she started saying this one phrase, how she, Marla Ion, would vomit if Aix hadn't used his buffing magic onto her as well. Aix immediately understood that she was vomiting because of drinking a lot of mana potions. He thought that she must have had very little magic power, and because she was always using rapid fire, she needed a lot of mana and she could only get that from potions. He thought that the best solution was to stop drinking all those potions and to change her tactics. Aix simply asked Marla what she wanted him to do because he didn't feel like buffing her and she just continued saying how she would vomit. Our protagonist grew sick and tired of hearing her nagging and he lifted up his hand and finally used his support one spell on her as well. Marla immediately felt better and she wanted to thank Aix but our protagonist slapped her across the face because he was tired of listening to her. Aix turned around to Sarah and she said how she didn't have money to pay him for his buff because her research wasn't buried any profit but she started taking off her clothes and said how he could use her body as payment and Aix hit her on the head as well to stop her from losing her dignity. I mean not that she has any in the first place. He told her that she was acting like a stupid person and he said that she could pay him when she gets the money for her research and that made her happy. Sarah thanked him and she said something that surprised Aix. She explained that those barriers were actually put up with magic and that's why it was almost impossible to prove their structures and that was the main reason for which she came to that town. Before Sarah could say anything more, Aix told her that he set up the barriers around the town and he explained how it was a normal fence with barbed wire on which he used his lightning magic so it would stun monsters and people that made contact with it. Even though the appraisal of the barrier said that it came from the Hollow Realm, that wasn't entirely true. There was a fence there and there wasn't an energy source powering it up. The magic the fence had was just an extended version of Aix's spell and that was basically it. Now Sarah also studied barriers that had hollow magic and she thought that she had a completely wrong approach to the whole matter but then she remembered that she couldn't reproduce any magic with science but it was possible to reproduce lightning. Our protagonist couldn't understand why Sarah was trying so hard to discover something new and she told Aix that that she had always felt a sense of duty but that was only what people thought. Her true reason was to get back at people who didn't believe in her while she was a child. She wanted to be a great scientist and she asked Aix whether he hated her for that. I mean Aix had nothing against her wish to reproduce his barrier as that would only mean that he wouldn't need to use his lighting magic on it anymore and he wished her the best of luck in her research. And Aix turned to Marla who was hiding beneath the bed. Marla said how she remembered how it felt when the kids she saved thanked her so she ended up thanking Aix for his support one magic. Our protagonist felt a bit ashamed for being in the same room with two beautiful women so he told them that it would be best if they all went their separate ways. When they got out onto the street both Sarah and Marla shouted how his thing was the best and how they can always count on him. That made Aix rather agitated because people immediately thought of something else and they were guilty that Aix was receiving strange and weird looks from the passerbys. Aix was now finally free to do what he wanted to do that day from the start and he walked down to Laka's workshop. He called out to Laka that he arrived and he thought to himself that she never left the workshop so he decided he was going to enter once again without an invitation. While he was entering her workshop he apologized for coming inside without an invitation and he said how he came to visit and all that. But Aix was greeted by a loud bang and confetti flying around and there was a surprise party that Laka and Lucky Bear prepared for his recognition as the great magician. Aix was shocked and he was at a loss for words. It took him some time to come to his senses and he told Laka that that must have been a misunderstanding because it couldn't have possibly been him because he was turned down from entering the magician's hermitage. Aix told her to read the newspapers and Laka said how she didn't believe a thing that the newspapers say because all they did was lie and hide the truth from the public. 
facts. But she opened the papers to prove AX that it was him the papers wrote about, but the article clearly said AX with E. Usually there is no E in our protagonist's name, but Laka used her finger to cover up the letter E. On top of that, Laka couldn't understand why was AX complaining about that because they prepared a nice surprise for him and he acted a bit strange. Our protagonist took a quick glance at the cake which looked rather delicious and he ended up going with the flow of the entire situation. He screamed out how he was the greatest magician AX and they started to celebrate. They sat at the table and Laka sliced off a huge piece of the cake and offered it to our protagonist. While AX enjoyed the delicious cake, Laka was sitting across him and she couldn't take her eyes off of him in before she offers her a pie as well. Now after Aix finished eating his slice, Laka asked him when he planned to move in together with her, which caught him off guard. Laka didn't understand his reaction because she thought that he ran out of money, which was inevitable since he wasn't working. But our protagonist just laughed and told her how she was even sweeter than the cake he just ate. My bro is the Giga Rizzler. Laka was surprised by those words and she thought that Aix might have actually worked something to get paid, but our protagonist explained how he sold one of his warm stones for one gold coin and he showed Laka what the stone was like. Laka inspected it and she wanted to keep one for herself because she liked it. Aix drank his tea and told Laka that he would have to keep that one for himself and maybe he would give it to someone else instead. Lucky Bear found a small earring and he asked Aix if he could make it into a warm stone as well but Aix explained that earrings aren't good for that because people's heads would get too hot. Laka found a pocket watch but Aix said that that was impossible because the metal of the watch would increase the temperature too much. Aix made a joke about giving the watch to Lucky Bear and he got scared that he would burn out because of the hotness. Lucky Bear ran back to Laka and Laka told Aix to stop being mean to him but Aix said that he wouldn't burn out because there was a difference between normal fire and a magic one and he gave an example of how trees wouldn't burn out if they were enchanted with fire. Lucky Bear was interested in what would happen if Aix enchanted him and he wanted to try it out. Aix got ready to try it out as well and one of Laka's bunnies ran to receive the enchantment as well. Our protagonist heated up the hollow spirits in his hands and then he enchanted Lucky Bear and the bunny that wanted the fire enchantment as well. They immediately felt the power and steam starting to come out from their plush bodies. Laka was surprised to see the steam and when she took Lucky Bear into her arms, she was so happy and satisfied with how warm he actually felt. Now not only could she cuddle with her plush toys, they could also keep her warm. It felt like Lucky Bear was actually a living person because he now even emitted heat as well and Laka was grateful to Aix for coming up with that idea. Aix hugged the bunny and he was glad Laka loved it. Laka saw that and she shouted at her plush bunny to get away from Aix. She was jealous and Aix made fun of her for feeling jealous of a plush toy. Maybe Laka is in love with Aix, but she was too shy to say it and when Aix kept joking with her, she just turned her head to the other way and said that he was an idiot. Laka turned away from Aix completely and Aix knew he had to do something so she would forgive him. He said that he would give her anything she wanted as a thank you for the cake and the surprise party they threw for him and it seemed like Laka was just waiting for something like that. She turned around with a happy smile on her face and told Aix that there was an event she wanted to attend. Aix had passed by a poster for a Sheep Town music festival but he didn't pay much attention to it. Now we see Aix riding in a carriage and he seemed content and happy. The carriage was going in the direction of Laka's workshop and Aix couldn't wait to see her again. When they arrived at her workshop, Laka was already packed and Aix shouted that he was there to pick her up. It seemed that they had made an agreement of going to the music festival and Laka seemed happy as well. Laka boarded the carriage and she said how she couldn't get any sleep the night before because she was thinking about the music festival and it turned out that Laka was the one that paid for the carriage and that was logical because Aix only had 10 silver coins at his disposal. Aix was enjoying the ride and even the driver was in a good mood because Laka paid him enough money. Aix was really grateful to Laka for everything she had done for him and when Laka entered the carriage, Aix was curious whether or not her plush bunnies could function properly on 
on their own and without Laka's supervision. Laka never thought about that before because she never traveled before, but Lucky Bear told her not to worry and there was no practical possibility to take all of them to the festival to begin with. Aix told her to forget about that for a second and to focus on the festival and Laka thanked both of them. In the meantime, the inn where Aix was usually staying in had some visitors that came to see him. It was Yesman and he needed to persuade Aix to make the cooling tubes for the Viscount as the deadline was approaching. Yesman knocked on the door of Aix's room, but he wasn't expecting a girl to open the door. Yesman apologized and he said that he thought that he was at the right address and said that he was looking for Aix. The little girl said that he was at the right address, but she referred to Aix as a master and said that he would be out of town for the next three days. Yesman thought how Aix acted all high and mighty when he criticized the nobles for having maids and slaves and yet there he was. He had a small girl serve him like a maid and call him a master. Another girl could be heard and she called out to Ray and it was probably Nitra and Yesman immediately recognized her from the honey trap incident. Yesman asked her whether her friend recovered from the illness and Nitra recognized Yesman as well when she saw him. Ray spoke out and said how she was the ill friend he was asking about and she explained to Yesman how she didn't have a cold at a time and that her illness was actually the curse of Hera and because of that Aix had to give all of his money to buy a cure for her. Ray also said that he gave them a place to stay after their house had burned down to the ashes the night before and Yasmin realized that he made a wrong assumption about Aix. He was actually a good kid all along. Nitra added how Aix was the great magician who always gave her skewers and Ray scolded her for saying that as that should remain a secret. The girls argued a bit and Yesman decided to act like he hadn't heard a thing. They told him that Aix probably won't be present at the inn for some time and Yesman excused himself and left. He thought that Aix was going to sheep down for the music festival and he immediately notified the guards to arrest him if he was seen with a magical tool. Yesman was determined to make Aix complete the 200 cooling tubes and only then would he let him go. Aix, Lucky and Lucky Bear have already arrived at the entrance to sheep down and Aix thanked the driver taking them there. The guards were kind-hearted and they welcomed them like true guests. They told them that they could pass through the main entrance and while their carriage was halfway through, a loud beeping sound was heard and it startled both Aix and Laka. The guards immediately pointed their spears towards the horses and they ordered the driver to stop the carriage. As the horses got a bit restless because of the sudden stop, Laka lost her balance and she almost fell out but Aix somehow managed to pull her and she ended up falling on top of him. Oh, the classic. Aix caught her in embrace but the impact made him hit his head and even though it hurt quite a bit he cared more about Laka and her well-being. Our protagonist looked through the window and asked to see what was happening and when he saw the driver explaining to the guards how they hadn't broken the law in any way. But the guards were strict and they said that the party was hiding rats in their cargo. That was what the guards thought the signal picked up at the entrance gate and they ordered everyone to exit the carriage while they searched it thoroughly. They kept looking and looking and they couldn't find anything. That was shocking to them as they knew that the signal on the gate caught four different people. One of the guards couldn't believe it because he only saw Aix and Laka and the driver of the carriage. But hearing all that, Lucky Bear couldn't help himself and he had to insult the guards. When the guards saw that the plush toy just talked, they were terrified and they didn't know what to do or how to react. That was probably their first and only time to ever witness such a thing. Aix just sighed and thought to himself how shocking it must have been to the guards. Lucky Bear already jumped out from Laka's arms and he was marching towards the guards to insult them some more and he was furious because they stopped the carriage and because they were surprised that he talked. But before he could reach the guards to attack them, Aix caught him and he apologized to the guards and said that they didn't want to cause any disturbance. 
The guard captain asked Aix about Lucky Bear because he had never seen a plush toy talk before and Aix explained how Lucky Bear was a spirit from the Hollow Realm and our protagonist tried to keep a smile on his face to avoid being caught. He also said that Lucky Bear would never harm anyone so the guards didn't have to worry about that but Lucky Bear then again started to rage and throw insults at the guard captain but Aix covered his mouth before he could say something that might get them in trouble. The guard captain asked them whether it would be okay to let Lucky Bear pass the gate to go to a music festival and Aix and Lucky tried to explain how he was just a harmless plushie. The guard captain realized that the signal went off only because of Lucky Bear's spirit and he apologized for stopping them and for not believing their words when they said that they were innocent. The party boarded the carriage once again and once inside Lucky Bear told Aix that he said some inappropriate things about him and Aix tried to defend himself by saying how it was all his fault. But Laka had something to say as well and she told Aix that something wasn't right and that that wasn't a normal checkup because of the fact that Lucky Bear did have his own ID card actually. Lucky Bear repeated what Laka said and Aix seemed to be a bit off and he asked them what would normally happen if he was missing an ID card. Laka knew that something was off and that the guards wouldn't pull them over for no reason because they weren't performing any random checkups because there was a magical tool built into the gate and that's what they heard before with the loud beeping sound. The magic tool could recognize criminals and people with missing ID cards and all other sorts of things. When she finished explaining everything about the gate, she asked Aix where his card was and whether he misplaced it somewhere. Our protagonist explained that he would never forget something so important but rather he didn't have one because the guild master had destroyed his previous ID card in front of him. But he was lucky that Lucky Bear was on board the carriage and the guards had mistakenly thought that he was the one without the ID card and they never even suspected Aix in the first place. Laka was also happy that they passed and she jokingly said that Aix couldn't do anything without her and she also added that they would get him a temporary ID card in Sheep Town once they get settled in. Aix was completely unaware of Yes Man's plan to stop them but somehow they managed to slip through and outsmart him once again. The three day trip had officially started and in the meantime Yes Man was racking his brains out thinking about our protagonist and him not leaving the town but he didn't know that they were long gone. Their carriage rolled into town and the town was already in its festive state and everything was decorated, the people were welcoming and the whole atmosphere was relaxing. Aix and Laka kept looking all around themselves to take in as much of that beauty as they could. Laka told them to look towards her side of the carriage and once Aix and Lucky Bear turned their heads, they could see fluffy sheep walking through the streets like they were full-time residents of that place. They were welcomed by the local guards and they had to pay two small silver coins for entering entering with a carriage. Aix thought that the whole town seemed rather pleasant and music could be heard almost everywhere. Our protagonist was also blown away by the sheer number of people because it was the biggest concentration of people in one place he had ever seen. The driver notified them that they would soon reach their designated tent and that they should prepare themselves. Aix looked through the carriage window and as far as his eyes could see, everything was covered with white tents. It seemed that during the summer it was possible to put up tents in Sheep Town and to spend the night there and it was something like a seasonal tradition while the music festival was ongoing. The driver notified them that they had already reached their tent and Aix told Lucky to get ready to leave the carriage but something seemed off with Laka now. She held Lucky Bear in her arms and she kept gripping him ever so tightly. She apologized to Aix and simply said that she couldn't do it and it was then that Aix realized what the problem was. Because Laka was shy and she had a fear of people like a social anxiety and it was only logical that she wouldn't feel safe in large crowds of strangers. Aix told her that she didn't need to worry and that he would handle the situation. He left the carriage to speak to the driver and asked him whether it would be possible for him to take them to the outskirts of the town and rent a room at an inn but the driver had to break it down to Aix by saying that there were no inns in the outskirts but there was something else they could do. The 
The driver told Aix that they could find a place that was less crowded and they could rent a tent there and Aix had no other choice but to go with that option. He climbed back up in the carriage and Laka couldn't stop shaking from fear. Aix had rented out a different tent but because everywhere was so crowded they couldn't find a space to put it up and as the night was slowly setting in our protagonist asked the driver to take them to the town suburbs. The driver was shocked by that request as he thought that they were going to attend the music festival once they took a good rest and Aix told the driver that he would be compensated for his troubles. The driver said that he would take them nonetheless and that he wouldn't take any more money for that and he just told them to sit back as the drive would probably take a bit longer as it was already dark and it was hard for him to see the road. While the carriage was driving, Laka felt the need to apologize to Aix and our protagonist realized that she blamed herself for their current situation. But Aix reassured her that he never blamed her and added that he would make sure that they don't regret their decision to come to Sheep Town for the music festival because after all, that should be their trip. Aix remembered how Laka helped him when he was at his lowest point in his life when he quit his job and when he was called a defective mage too and so on and Aix felt how it was his turn to prove to Laka that she was special as well. Our protagonist asked Laka whether she had some silver cloth in her luggage and Laka did have it but she couldn't understand why Aix would ask for it. But Aix immediately told her how he would love it if she could make him a wizard's hat that was the size of Lucky Bear. Lucky Bear told Aix that it was a little bit embarrassing to ask for gifts unexpectedly like that and Laka didn't particularly mind Aix's request and she reached out with her hand and casted her ghost van spell. Immediately after she did that, a silver cloth came flying out of her luggage and Aix was completely blown away as that was the first time he had ever seen such magic. Laka was showing Aix everything she could do with the cloth and she said how her magic could make a simple cloth turn into a ghost sheet. Laka then asked Lucky Bear to help her as he was her sewing master and Lucky Bear took his scissors and went to work. He was fired up whenever there was something that Laka asked of him and this time it was no different. After a couple of moments of cutting and ripping and sewing, Lucky Bear stood in front of the cloth that he had just tore apart into several smaller pieces and now he was ready to make the hat that Aix wanted. Lucky Bear used his skill called Seven Needles and in a matter of seconds, after spinning around like crazy, he had finished the wizard's hat and it looked mwah. Perfect. The hat had landed on his head and Lucky Bear slowly raised it to one side and he yelled out how he completed his task. The whole time they were performing their magic, Aix was sitting back and enjoying the show and he even applauded and congratulated both of them on being such good magicians. Laka still didn't understand what Aix wanted to do with the hat, but as he took it from her hands, Aix had a smile on his face and it was clear and obvious that he was up to something. Aix held the tiny hat in his hand and he proclaimed how he was indeed the great magician Aix and now he was going to cast his magic onto the hat and with that he would create something incredible and Laka was really surprised to get a performance from Aix as well. Before anything extra spectacular, Aix used his shield enchantment to increase the hat's defense and the cloth seemed to harden a bit and Laka was curious as to why he would do something like that. Aix didn't say anything and he continued with his show and he turned the hat around and used another spell on it. This time he used the flash spell and with that a light was put inside the hat which started glowing. Aix called that a neon lantern and it was all done and ready to be used. He gave it to Laka to try it out and he told her to turn it outwardly through the window and once Laka did that the whole forest was illuminated and that made Laka speechless as everything was pitch black just seconds ago. Laka was blown away by Aix's skills and she told him how she never saw a lantern that was brighter than that one and Lucky Bear said that the lantern was great even though he expected to receive it as a gift and Aix was really happy that he could make them feel better especially Laka. Aix wanted to make one more so the driver could have it and he asked Laka whether it would be a problem for her and she said that she would gladly make another one. They finished it in no time and Aix gave it to the driver whose mind was completely bent. He couldn't believe that such a lantern that basically turned 
the night into day existed. The driver realized how special the lantern was and he asked Aix whether he could keep it, to which Aix responded that the lantern was made as a gift for him and that the light inside would last for an entire year. The driver was both delighted and speechless and he was so glad they continued their journey without any problems as now the horses could see everything. On top of that, the driver was really pleased he took that job because he had gotten a wonderful gift. They continued for a while longer and the driver took them to a nearby hill which overlooked Sheep Town and asked them whether they liked that location for their tent. Both Aix and Laka were amazed by the sight of Sheep Town from afar and the most important thing was that the place wasn't crowded at all and they were the only people out there. Laka made a comment on how beautiful the town looked and she was grateful to Aix for understanding her needs and our protagonist was glad they came there because they had seen a wonderful sight. However, there was no time to be lost so Aix told everyone that they should put the tent up. The driver told Aix that he would take the horses and securely tie them to a tree so they could rest in peace. Our protagonist suggested they wait for the driver to come back and only then that they start putting up the tent but Laka asked him about the size of the tent he had rented out. Aix didn't really know the exact size but it was an average tent and he told Laka that it probably couldn't fit two people together but he had rented out another tent for her and Lucky Bear and that made Laka a little bit angry. Aix wanted to unpack the tents to show them to Laka and Lucky Bear but Lucky Bear smacked him on the back of his head. Our protagonist was angry at Lucky Bear for hitting him and when he turned around he could see that Laka was really angry due to the fact that Aix wanted to stay in separate tents even while while they were on vacation. Aix told her that there were no bigger tents to rent out and he asked Laka what he could do and Laka told him to sit back and take a rest while she did something, she would just need his help when she was all done. Laka casted another one of her spells and this time it was the King Ghost Cloth spell and immediately another giant cloth came flying out from her luggage. Laka called out to Lucky Bear and told him to show Aix his true form, the King saw in master form and that got Lucky Bear all fired up again. Aix couldn't understand what it was the two were making and as he kept looking, his shock grew even bigger. When they finished, Aix could see a whole castle in front of him. Before he could admire it, Laka told him to hurry up and use the same spell he used on the heads to harden them because the castle was slowly losing its shape. Aix understood his task and he used his shielded chant spell and Laka lost consciousness and luckily Aix was there to catch her and save her from hitting her head on the ground. Our protagonist was so scared and he took her face into his hands and Laka slowly opened her eyes and saw Aix holding her and looking down on her. It seemed that she fell due to exhaustion and the first words that came out of her mouth when she came by was that the castle was for Aix, her dear prince. Aix was completely shocked and Lucky Bear called him king because he had his castle now. But Lucky Bear also told him to stop flirting with Laka and usher them to go inside the castle. They opened the creaking doors and once they entered, they saw how spacious it was inside. Aix was blown away by the sheer size of the castle but it was empty inside and a little bit frightening and Laka agreed with him. While they were inside castle, they heard the driver had come back and as he was looking for them, he was shocked to find a huge castle on the place where he left them. He couldn't fathom the thought of it being built in such a short amount of time and Aix went out to greet him and told him that he could look at the castle like it was just a huge tent. The driver was really confused and Aix told them that they had built the castle just moments ago and Aix invited the driver inside so he can take a look. The driver entered the castle and he was also very surprised by how big everything was and he called Aix and Laka prodigies for building such a big castle in such a short time. The driver added that the castle would be entirely finished if it had some furniture as well and it would be perfect then. Lucky Bear said that the ghost furniture would make everything even cooler but for that they would need a constant source of magic power but as Aix was there, Lucky Bear wasn't worried about that. The driver couldn't wait to see what else they were going to do but Aix was worried about Laka because she had just fallen unconscious moments ago. She was still slightly dizzy but she opened her suitcase and she took out one of those mana potions that Marla used as well and drank it in one huge gulp. Aix knew that she had 
had to be out of mana after creating something as big as the castle they were in. Laka was searching for something in her luggage and she finally found it. It was a miniature of a creepy dollhouse and she threw the miniature in the air and cast her ghost house spell. The driver couldn't keep his mouth shut from all the shock he had experienced and Aix was amazed with Laka's magic. In a matter of seconds, a huge castle appeared in front of them and even though it looked really well, there was a gloomy atmosphere in the air around it. Lucky Bear ushered Aix to hurry up and use his spell to apply the mana buff onto the castle and Aix hesitated at first but he ended up doing it nonetheless. The driver was either going crazy or there were actual sounds coming from inside the castle. Lucky Bear informed them that the sound was coming from a shadow monster from inside the castle and he added that he wasn't afraid of it. The driver was screaming for help as the shadow was flying around him and he was scared to death but he couldn't do anything because he was literally paralyzed with fear. The driver was losing his mind and he asked Aix to remove the ghost house but our protagonist knew that that wasn't possible at the moment because he had just cast a buffing spell onto it and that would make it last for quite some time. The driver was losing his mind and Aix knew he had to help him. The only problem with that was that he didn't know how to get rid of a shadow monster. Laka just stood there calmly and in her hand she held a neo lantern that Aix had just made and by shaking it the lantern started shining. I mean it was just logical that you should cast light onto shadows and that would make them go away right? That's what they did. They went through the whole castle and eliminated all of the shadows and once that was all done Aix sat down to take a rest and Laka went to take a bath. After some time, Laka came out of the bath in her pajamas and Aix was speechless when he saw her. He told her that he used some ice balls to cool down some juice so she could have a refreshing drink and Aix made his way to the bath so he could have a shower himself. Laka called out to him before he left and when he turned around, she thanked him and said that her day was filled with fun and happiness and Aix agreed that they had good fun. He finished bathing and he opened the window from inside the bathroom to take a look at Sheep Town at night and everything looked so beautiful because the lights were on. Aix really enjoyed every second of his trip to Sheep Town but in the meantime someone wasn't having such a good time as he was. In the Viscount's mansion, Yes Man's name was shouted out and he hurriedly came to see what the Viscount wanted. The Viscount was so furious that he was shaking and even his teeth were clamoring again each other. He was soaking wet and he ordered Yesman to capture Aix for treason immediately. Yesman didn't know what happened and he asked the Viscount for an explanation as he wanted to understand what he meant by the word treason. The Viscount explained how his bath was ice cold even though it looked perfectly normal and the Viscount blamed Aix for that and that was the main reason he was shaking. Even though he was angry, the shaking part came due to the extreme cold which he felt and it was really uncomfortable for someone who was used to comfort. Yesman didn't know what to say back to his master and he just thought to himself that the magic that Aix had used on the bath finally stopped working as well as everything else in the mansion. But even if that was so, Yesman had put a sign on the bath to forbid anyone from using it just because of something like that happening. The Viscount had another one of his wonderful ideas and Yesman just stood there silently and listen to his master. The Viscount said that he would order the forest guard to look for Aix and he would personally talk to them to make sure that everything important was conveyed. Yesman thought that that was a good idea and he said that he would arrange a meeting with them as soon as he could. But Yesman knew how dangerous was the hero association that the forest guard's captain was a part of and he knew that the hero association was a notorious organization and as he didn't want to have problems with them he never approached them in the past. After a couple of days, Yesman managed to arrange everything and two men came into the mansion and they were sitting at a table in the waiting room. One of them was the captain of the forest guard and his name was Aizel and the other one was the captain of the army and his name was Lyog. I don't know how to pronounce this. L-Y-O-G. Log. Lyog. Log. 
I'll call him log, like the tree log. <laughs> now the two weren't really at the best of terms as they kept throwing insults at one another and at their respected organizations. Isel commented on how dirty Log's armor was and Log said that that was due to training and if Isel's armor missed some scratches in dirt, it meant that he wasn't training as much as he should have. Isel said how he hated the word training because he thought that that was something only the weak people used and he told Log that there was no need for him to train as no incident had ever happened while he was the captain of the forest guard for the last five years. But before they could get really into a heated dispute, a sound of doors opening was heard and inside came the Viscount. At the sight of the Viscount, Isel immediately stood onto his feet and pledged his loyalty to the Viscount. Log was someone who immediately wanted to cut right to the chase and he asked the Viscount to tell them about the job he had for the two of them. The Viscount explained how there was a defective mage who he hired before and everything was good while the mage worked for him. However, the mage decided to quit his job up and he fled without finishing his duties. I mean, this wasn't true at all, but that's how delusional the, the Viscount was. And the job would be simple, they just needed to find that mage and capture him. Isel thought to himself how the mage was irresponsible and how he should pay for what he did and he even commented how young people never did anything right. But Log asked a very good question. He wanted to know the reason why the mage even chose to run away and the Viscount turned his back as he didn't want to answer that question. The Viscount added how the job was also a great opportunity for their respective organizations as well as he intended to increase the budget of the organization that captured the mage first. The Viscount said that his butler would tell them all the details and that was all he had to say. Yesman entered the waiting room after the Viscount had left and he told Isel and Log that there was only two conditions that they have to meet. The first one was that they needed to send in progress reports daily and that if they were to catch aches, they needed to capture him without harming him in any way possible. That was everything they needed to know and Yesman wished them luck and he couldn't wait to hear about their success success. Normally Log and his army controlled the territory and it was logical that they had the advantage of capturing Aegs, however, Isil had a secret plan. Isil approached Urekel, the gangster from the ghetto we mentioned earlier, and Isil was brought into Urekel's office and he was with a woman that was in love with him. When Isil entered, she left so they could talk without being disturbed. Isil introduced himself as the captain of the forest guard and he said that he had a job for Urekel and that he should feel flattered and glad that he came to see him. Urekel was a bit surprised but he wasn't going to lower his pride as he knew that Isel had no other choice than to see him and he didn't let Isel call him a rat. Urekel knew that when Isel came to him in person the matter was serious and if Isel continued to act rudely he would just refuse his request. Isel realized that Urekel wasn't the fool he thought he was and he had to change his strategy if he wanted him to cooperate. Isel said that he was only joking when he said that and he proceeded to tell Urekel everything about the job he had for him. When Isel mentioned that the name of the person they had to capture was Aix, Urekel spilled his drink immediately. If that was the case, Urekel said he would accept the offer if Isel paid him three large silver coins immediately and one gold coin after the job was done. Isel wanted to know what would happen with the money that he would pay Urakel up front if he failed to capture Aix and Urakel simply responded that Isel would be at loss. It was simple. Isel would lose some of his money and Urakel would lose his credibility. Isel said that he wouldn't pay any money in advance until he saw what Urakel had at his disposal. And just then, he heard a clicking sound of a crossbow and he felt someone behind him. It was Urakel's lover and the boy that served as the honey trap for Aches. The woman held a crossbow and the boy held a knife on Isel's neck. Urakel was glad with how they acted and he asked Isel about the upfront money and the sum they agreed on. Because Isel was scared, he said that he would pay him even 5 large silver coins and Urakel told him that they had a deal. So Urakel told the little boy Ren to go out and call someone whom Urakel referred to as the bald guy and to tell him that there was a job for him. 
Hirakel had some fun with his lover while he waited for the men to come and once he came, he ordered him to create a channel to the army's headquarters so they could gather more information. The bull guy was actually a magician called Signet and he was a specialist when it came to listening in on people. He used his wall ear spell and with no difficulty, he could hear what the army officers were talking about. Eurekel knew that it was only a matter of time they reveal Aik's location to him and all he needed to do was to sit back and wait. The soldiers talked between themselves about Aik's and they realized that it was the same Aik's that Yesman ordered them to capture him in the past but Log told them that now they had more information. The information they had didn't show any records of Aik's leaving the town but the soldiers said that they overheard some rumors that he left. Log had to take everything into account and he couldn't reject the possibility of Aik's still being in the area. The soldiers came up with a plan of catching Aix at the inn when he finally shows up and they would do so with renting a room next to his room and they would be able to catch him by surprise. Now Eurekel heard what he needed and he told Ren to elaborate the plan. Ren told Eurekel that booking one room for half a day would cost one small silver coin and they needed to book all 10 rooms for 5 days straight. That would be a large silver coin and Eurekel agreed and added another large silver coin to anyone who found eggs first. He was happy with his plan and he went to report everything to Isel the following day. When they met, Isel was concerned that the army would find eggs before he came back to the inn, so he told Eurakel that he should hire more people for the search as well. Eurakel didn't like the extra work, but he didn't have any other choice and eggs first went to the inn and he came across Nitra. He asked her what happened to her house and whether she got hired somewhere as she was wearing maid's clothes. Nitra explained that she was serving eggs and that they all lived in his room. Eurekel asked her if by any chance she knew where he was or when he would return, but Nitra said nothing. She only talked about how great Aik's room was and how everything felt comfortable and the way she described it made Eurekel think of the Viscount's mansion, another room at some inn. Eurekel thought that the Viscount ordered the search for eggs because it was possible that Aik stole stuff from the Viscount's mansion. So next stop for him was Lacus workshop and they went there and rang the bell. Nothing seemed to happen so they went inside and Eurekel told them to find Laka, but he told them that he needed her alive. Ren and Signet searched everywhere but what they found was a bunch of traps and loud clanging noises could be heard from the inside of the workshop. They shouted out how they were in trouble and Eurekel rushed inside to check on them because he feared that they had gotten ambushed and when Eurekel entered the workshop through the window he saw Signet tied on the floor. Eurekel knew about Lucky Bear and he was treading carefully because he didn't want to be caught like Ren and Signet. Eurekel saw Ren in another room hanging on some threads and when he approached him Ren shouted out to leave him alone as he would be captured as well and right in that moment a rope was thrown over Eurekel's neck and he was knocked on the ground. One of Laka's rabbits climbed on top of him and asked him about their business there and Eurekel was surprised to see the rabbit talk as well and as he was afraid he told the rabbit that they were just looking for eggs. When the rabbit heard that he ordered the other bunnies to release Ren and Signet. It seemed that they were looking for Aix as well because they felt betrayed. They couldn't forgive Aix and Laka for leaving them behind and they told Eurekel that they were in Sheep Town attending a music festival. On the second day of their trip to Sheep Town and to the music festival, Aix woke up and he wanted to see whether Laka was up as well so he knocked on her door. Laka invited him in and she seemed rather happy to see him. Aix brought her some milk that he had had for breakfast a couple of moments ago but Laka immediately proposed that they should have some tea. Even though Aix didn't mean to drink tea, he went to boil the water. When the tea was brewed, they enjoyed their cups of tea while sitting on the bed. Laka was feeling down and she apologized to Aix for inviting him to the music festival because it was her idea but she was feeling so overwhelmed in large crowds that there probably won't be a chance they could go. But Aix told her that everything has been perfectly fine because he enjoyed riding in the carriage with her and Lucky Bear as well and he loved the whole music festival vibe. Even the driver had a great time in the ghost house despite being terrified of it. 
when he saw it for the first time. Uh, Laka was feeling a bit down because they came all the way to Sheep Town and now they couldn't attend the music festival. So she asked Aix if there was anything else he wanted to do and Aix said that there was something. He continued by saying how he wanted to get a replacement for his ID card which the guildmaster tore into and it was only then that Laka and Lucky Bear found out why they were stopped at the gates. Laka was furious because the guildmaster would be at fault if they were stopped and Aix was imprisoned but Aix told her that it was alright because he hadn't seen him in a long time. Laka was glad that Aix left the guild because she wanted to know what he would do next and whether or not he would accept the invitation to the magician's hermitage. Aix said that they already rejected him once and having taken everything into account he thought that he would probably end up becoming a merchant because he wanted to see whether or not he would be able to live decent by only selling his warm stones. Laka simply said that she would go alone to fetch a new ID for our protagonist and Aik said that he wanted to go too but Laka was hesitant to let him accompany her. The reason for that was that she was afraid that some beautiful girl would fall in love with him and she didn't want that as she was already in love with Aix. But Aix wanted to reassure her that even if he met any new people, Laka would always remain his best friend and Laka was so agitated by those words because instead of being her best friend Aix was everything to her my bro just friend zoned her in the end they ended up going together after all and as they walked Aix thought to himself how happy he was that the streets weren't as crowded in the mornings as they were when they arrived Aix wanted to hurry to the commercial guild finish everything and get his ID card as soon as possible so they could head back to the castle but Laka was feeling a little bit stiff she told Aix that she felt a presence that was spying on them and she said that they were far, it was probably a woman and that she wasn't alone and Aix really thought that they were the bad bugs, women that want to keep him for themselves that they just talked about in the castle. Laka noticed that Aix was thinking about beautiful women simping over him and she smacked him on the back of his head because of that. They arrived at the commercial guild and Aix hesitated to go inside because of the possibility of encountering bad bugs but he needed to get his replacement ID card but before he could enter they were greeted by a woman that thought that they were brother and sister. Aix explained that he just wanted to register and acquire a new ID card but the girl told him that that would be impossible at the moment because everyone that worked in the commercial guild attended the music festival and while the festival was ongoing the guild would remain closed. That made Aix sad and after Lucky Bear saw him he yelled out to the woman to help them out. At first the woman couldn't move nor speak when she heard a plush toy talk to her especially in that way and after a couple of moments she showed her utmost surprise by that phenomenon. <laughs> Aix quickly took Lucky Bear into his arms and started running away from the woman and said that he was just a ventriloquist. When they ran a safe distance from the woman, Aix explained to Lucky Bear that he needed to pay more attention to how his interactions would make Laka feel and Lucky Bear apologized and immediately after he turned around and told Aix and Laka that the women that had been spying on them finally caught up to them. And when Aix and Laka turned around, they could really see two female silhouettes and they looked like elves and they came out once they understood that Aix and Laka had seen them. They apologized for disturbing them and making them unease and they added how they were sent by their master to invite Aix and Laka to her place. Aix and Laka just gave each other a look and they decided to go with the flow and they accepted the invitation. The two elvish ladies brought them to a flying ship and told them to hop on a board as their master was waiting for them and Lucky Bear joked with Aix about who that master might have been. They all boarded the ship and Aix and Laka were brought to the captain whose name was Amin. She was a cute little girl and she explained how she was the queen of the country of Iron and that her full name was Amin the Dwarf. I mean she looked more like an elf instead of a dwarf but okay, I'll give it to you. <laughs> Aix introduced himself and Laka and Lucky Bear and he added that Laka was normally shy in front of larger groups of people and that's why Emin decided to let her subordinates go away so they could all talk in peace. When the women that stalked them had left, Aix asked Emin why she wanted to see them and Emin proceeded to tell her story. She started off by saying how the women that stalked them reported something back to her and that's why she grew more curious 
about them and she knew immediately she had to talk to them and while she was telling that story, Aix thought to himself that she was talking about him and then wondered whether or not that would be the moment that would change his fate completely. Aix's heart was thumping very loudly as Emin was about to say the true reason why she wanted to see them and when she finally did, our protagonist felt a bit stupid for getting all excited and he couldn't believe that someone would go through all that fuss just for that. So the true reason for which Emin called them on board of her ship was the new crazy doll briefcase that Laka carried around with her. Emin explained that she was a doll collecting enthusiast and she was a big fan of the Credol brand and she just wanted to know where she could buy one of those bags for herself. Laka asked her whether that was the only reason why they were called in to see her and Emin didn't think there would ever be a problem with that as that seemed perfectly normal to her. I mean bros, I know I'm gonna offend a lot of you and a lot of people of the world but i really don't get collectors why would you bother collecting stuff just so in your mind you can tell yourself oh i've got this collection of something i know a lot of people are collectors but i personally have no clue why would somebody do it i have a friend who's collecting like Yu Gi Oh cards and he's spending so much money on those cards literally to put them in like a book collection book and keep them there and whenever he would meet somebody new or somebody that doesn't know about his collection he would show those people that collection but they just don't care about it so i honestly don't get collectors at all i haven't collected anything in my life except for maybe my parents disappointments <laughs> I'm, I'm joking i'm good i'm good let's go back to the story luck apologized to Aix because she could feel how excited he was but he would still have to wait to be recognized as a great magician and he would still need to go through a lot to become a legend and Aix felt a bit embarrassed for getting all worked up about what basically ended up as nothing Emin couldn't understand what Laka and Aix were talking about and she just wanted to acquire that briefcase for herself. She said that if Laka couldn't tell her where she got hers, she should tell her the price of her briefcase and Emin would buy it from her. Laka whispered to Aix that her briefcase was very special and that she couldn't give out all the details about it and not even money would cut it as Laka couldn't sell it to someone she had just met moments ago and she asked Aix to tell her that. Emin was getting impatient listening to the two of them whisper between each other and Aix finally broke the silence by saying how he wanted to reintroduce Laka to her. Aix told Emin that Laka was actually the designer for Crazy Doll, Cradol, and that that was her brand. Emin was completely blown away after she heard that and she ran down to ask for an autograph from Laka. Lucky Bear had to intervene and act as Laka's security guard and he told Emin to stay at a safe distance as she wasn't allowed to touch Laka. Emin was now practically begging for a way she could acquire such a bag for herself and Aix told her that Laka wasn't only thinking about money and that she wanted her customers to be kind and graceful as well. Emin understood that but she asked Aix in what type of a relationship was he with Laka and how they knew each other and before Aix could give his answer, Emin answered it for herself and she decided that Aix must be Laka's boyfriend. Okay, quick funny story, a couple of years ago I was talking with this girl we were texting and decided to go out like for the first date and when i was texting with her i was always saying like every single girl i meet always gives me compliments calls me beautiful pretty cute stuff like that of course she took it as a joke she would laugh ha 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 yeah right yeah right so when we went out actually for the first time we wanted to grab something quick to eat so we went to like the small bakery in my town and when we entered the bakery there was a girl working at the counter selling you know bakery stuff and she asked the two of us there were only three of us in the bakery at the time she asked the two of us what kind of a relationship are we in and we didn't specify anything so this took her a little bit by surprise and i responded saying we're just friends and the girl working at the bakery then commented oh if you're just friends and not boyfriend and girlfriend then I want to tell you that you're really, really cute. But after we went out of the bakery, the girl that I was out with told me, wait, I thought you were actually joking when you said the girls call you pretty and beautiful and stuff like that, but it's actually true. So yeah. I'm a Giga Chat Bros. Now back to the story. After Emin called them that, Aix was dumbstruck, but Laka had a smile on her face and she thought to herself how Emin was a great person after all. Aix told Emin that Laka had agreed to make such a bag for her as well and Emin was overwhelmed with happiness. Aix didn't really understand what made Laka change her mind, but in the end he was glad everything worked out well. 
Emin was super grateful and she said that if they needed anything, they could just ask her and she would get it done and Laka said that she would be completely fine as long as she got paid for her briefcase. Aix didn't think his answer through and he said that he didn't need anything but Lucky Bear came to him and told him that he could ask Emin to issue a new replacement ID card for him. Emin was curious about Aix's condition and Aix explained everything to her. Emin understood everything and she decided that she would help him with that. That, but before anything she had something for Aix and Laka. One of Emin's subordinates came holding a plate with two small boxes and when they opened them inside they found a gold medal given to great craftsmen. Emin then told them that the medal had their names on them and that in her country everyone with the medal was thought of as having exceptional talent and the medals could be used to prove their identity. Laka tugged Aix's cloak and she was happy that they both had matching medals and that made Aix smile as well. Emin told them that the medals had another great feature in her country and that intrigued Aix even more. The special feature was that the medal could be shown to any shop or restaurant owner and they would immediately be offered alcohol free of charge. What? I mean, couldn't you just go to the liquor store for example, take everything they have and just sell it to other people and make money like that? What? Okay, anyways, Emin was very proud of that special feature as she was a dwarf and they are known to drink very much, but Aix wasn't really sure that he would use that special feature that often because he basically never drank. Emin left and she invited the two of them to listen to some music with her if they had no other plans. Laka was anxious and she asked Emin if by listening to music meant that they would have to go among the crowd to attend the festival and Emin almost felt insulted. She told Laka that they won't have to come down from the ship as Emin could just simply invite all of the festival performers on board and they could enjoy the festival without ever going among the crowds, among those plebs. <laughs> And that was exactly what they did. Emin invited all the performers to board her ship and to play music specially for them and it was like a private party and they all had a great time. Aix was amazed at the power rich people all over the world had and even though he had completely given up on going to the festival, he was very happy that Laka got to enjoy the music despite her social anxiety. It was all thanks to Queen Emin and they clanked their wine glasses and partied. When the private show was over, Aix and Laka had had a great time but it was time for them to go back to their castle tent. Emin was a bit sad that they were leaving and she invited them to stay the night on board of her ship and Lucky Bear yelled out that Laka's tent was much more comfortable than anything else and that made Emin interested in what it actually looked like. Aix had to shush Lucky Bear because he didn't want the castle exposed and he tried explaining to Emin that it was just a normal sized tent but they felt free and comfortable there because it was theirs. Emin had already decided that she wanted to check it out for herself and there was no going back now and Emin told them to buckle up as the ship was about to take off and once they were in mid-air, Aix and Lucky Bear were completely delighted to experience flying for the first time in their lives. Aix was completely amazed with the sight from the window and Emin was proud with her being a dwarf because the dwarves were mostly recognized for their technical prowess. While they were enjoying each other's company, one of Emin's subordinates came to notify her that there was a level 3 danger alarm going off and that they needed her help and guidance at the wheelhouse. Emin was worried and she was angry at the same time as her fun time was interrupted by something so she hurried over to the wheelhouse to see what was going on. When she entered one of her subordinates told her that they came upon a suspicious looking castle which was completely unknown to them and it was located exactly at the place they were going to land at. Emin took some time to process that information and she turned around and told Aix and Laka that there was an unknown castle at the location of their tent and Aix and Laka felt a bit ashamed so our protagonist admitted that that was actually their tent the whole time. Emin was completely blown away and she couldn't believe how good Laka was and she didn't specialize only in doll making but she was also able to make great castles like the one below them. Emin informed her subordinates that the castle belonged to her friends and the supposed danger was no more. The ship landed next to the castle and Aix thanked Emin for the ride but Emin was impatient to see the insides of the castle so they had to show her what it all looked like. They entered the castle and as Emin could see 
it was pretty big and pretty empty inside and that made her think that she could hold events there as it had a lot of space. Aix told her that that wasn't the main specialty of Lucas' craftsmanship and he showed her the ghost house as well. When they entered the ghost house, Emin was speechless with just how much of the furniture it had inside and how comfortable everything was. Emin couldn't understand how they could make something like that in such a short time because everything was perfect and it was in no way comparable to a tent. She was shocked with the level of magic Laka and Aix possessed. Aix told her that the first floor at the ghost house was vacant and that Emin could use it to stay the night if she wanted. She was delighted but she found something that shocked her even more and that was one of Aix's water jugs that had an endless source of water. Emin couldn't believe that something like that existed as she couldn't see any magic stones that would make the magic last. Emin couldn't stop herself from being amazed every minute as she found out everything about all of our protagonist's inventions like the hot shower water to name just one. She was a about to have a wonderful evening as well, but in the meantime, while Aix and Laka were having a great time with their new friend Emin, the Viscount was attending a party and he was clearly frustrated because there were no clues about where Aix might have been and he could have been everywhere. The Viscount thought to himself that by the time the party started, Aix would have already been found and he would be making the cooling tubes for him. The Viscount got approached by a man that looked rather frustrated as well, but he was frustrated because the Viscount made a promise that he would supply him with cooling tubes but the summer had already ended and he wanted to know when would the Viscount live up to his promise and deliver what he needed to deliver. To add to the man's frustration, his daughter kept asking him about the cooling tubes as she wanted to have say magic tool that the princess had and the Viscount only told him that he would need to wait a little bit longer as the exact deadline hadn't been determined yet. Before the man left, he told the Viscount that he could forget about their deal which made the Viscount even angrier. Not only that man, everyone was making comments about the Viscount, even some ladies on the balcony. The Viscount heard them say his name and he thought he might get lucky tonight but when he came closer the ladies were talking about how they heard rumors that his magician got away from him and refused to work with him any longer. They continued by saying how his mansion experienced all sorts of troubles since then and that the Viscount even tried to use a little girl as a bait and the ladies were really afraid and grossed out due to being in his presence. The Viscount left the party enraged by such comments and when he came back to his mansion he slammed his fists onto the table. He told Yesman what happened and he wanted to know whether there was any progress with the operation to catch Aix. Yesman told him that they were working all day and night to find him but neither Isel nor Lyog had any information concerning Aix. The Viscount couldn't take it anymore and he shouted out that if they don't find Aix and make him create 200 cooling tubes his house would be completely destroyed and he would lose all the reputation he had and while he was shouting he started to cough pretty badly and Yesman had to call a doctor as he was worried about his health. Yesman was losing his mind because all that stress was having an effect on him as well and his mind was racing with thoughts about aches and where he could be. Yesman knew that Aix had no sense of danger and it would be almost impossible that he was actually hiding. There was one more thing that Yesman could try and that was something called World Search and to use that, Yesman went to the magician's hermitage to ask them to help him out. He was greeted by the Kakui, the investigation mage and she told him that he could count on her if he needed information about anyone. When Yesman showed her a report about Aix, Kakui was so shocked that she she fell from her chair. She asked Yesman whether he personally knew Aix and Yesman was surprised that Kakui was using honorifics when she mentioned Aix's name. She said that she only knew about him but she never met him in person but after their little conversation Kakui decided to help Yesman and she used her spell. She told Yesman that Aix was located in Sheep Town and that he was accompanied by Laka the puppet master. Yesman couldn't believe what he just heard and he had never heard that someone slipped by the tight security at the entrance to the sheep town. Kakui also told Yesman that Aix was deemed as the great magician 
and yes man couldn't believe that as well he told her that he was looking for a mage called eggs that could only use elementary magic and kakui told him that eggs was special because his magic was actually called advanced mimicry and that she was fooled by that in the past as well yes man exited the magician's hermitage and although he couldn't understand what kakui was saying he found out eggs whereabouts and he was about to inform Lyog and Aizel about that. When they got the much needed information about Aix's whereabouts, Lyog and Aizel immediately started making moves. Lyog climbed on top of his dragon and he flew over sheep down looking for Aix. He was flying for some time when he noticed someone that was rather sus looking to him and he ordered his dragon to land. The person turned around and saw Lyog who looked rather angry and satisfied at the same time. Lyok tried to utter Aix's name, but he couldn't remember it if his life depended on it. In the end, he pronounced something as Axelon, which even caught the stranger unprepared. The stranger told him that he didn't know anything about anyone named Axelon, and he also added that he was scared because he had thought that Lyok was after him because he had a bounty on his head. That was the man's downfall as Lyog decided he would capture him nonetheless. Lyog was actually very strong but being smart wasn't one of his perks and he ended up mixing eggs with a complete stranger. In the meantime Aizu was making his own plan in the open. People walked by and no one paid much attention to him but one little girl who pointed out her mom that there were small bunnies on the street that were sewing something. Now back in Sheep Town inside the castle that Laka Laka Bear and Aix had built, Aix was in his room and he was doing something we actually never saw him do before. He was talking to a small dark presence and he asked it whether it was feeling happy and satisfied with its life. The small dark circle was actually Aix's hollow and it ended up transforming into a tiny mage and landed on Aix's hand. The hollow said how he wasn't really happy with the way his life looked. Aix knew his hollow had suffered a bit because of him being overworked and he looked at him like he was his alter ego. But Aix also thought that his hollow would be satisfied after everything fun and good that had recently happened. So Aix asked his hollow whether there was anything he could do for him to make his life a bit more enjoyable but his hollow was hiding his small face. Aix apologized to him to begin with and he apologized for everything he did that he didn't like like eating the Jerome's mana potions and overworking himself. Aix told him that he wanted to make things right between them and he urged his hollow to tell him what he wanted. The thing his hollow wanted was a bunch of slime pillows. Aix was at the same time happy he told him his wishes and he was also annoyed with the fact that his wish was about something that lewd my bro you literally hoarded those pillows yourself so he hurried to talk to laka and when he found her she was a bit surprised to see him all worked up our protagonist told her that he wanted to go back home the first thing the next morning and laka said that that wouldn't be a problem and aix apologized for asking her such things out of the blue lucky bear was sad that they were leaving the next morning as they had a lot of fun these past couple of days and laka hugged him and told him that they would be back next year as well. Amin was there too and she was sad that they were leaving but she was happy to having met them and having spent great time with all of them and Aix and Laka thanked her as well for all the things she did for them. Aix told her that as they would leave the next morning they had decided to give her the castle as a gift because of all the things she had done for them and Amin was delighted to hear that. Even though she was very happy she couldn't just accept that big of a gift without giving anything back to them and she decided that she would give 5 gold coins to both Laka and Aix. Emin wouldn't take no for an answer and Aix was really happy about that because it was so unexpected. However, Emin asked Aix what was he going to do about all the people that were after him and Aix told her that it was probably one person that was behind all that and that was Viscount Redlich. Aix suspected it was all his doing because he had problems with him before but Aix was about to go to his mansion and decline his request once again. Emin knew she had heard that name before and she remembered who the Viscount at question was and she told Aix that she would accompany him because she couldn't feel at ease letting him go alone. Emin told them to notify their driver about their plan and Aix felt a bit ashamed to having to rely on Emin until the very end. Someone approached them and when they turned around it was one of Laka's bunnies who told them
them that all of the other bunnies from the workshop were there as well and they also wanted to have a go on the carriage. Laka was completely shocked to see them and Aegis decided to notify the driver. After a couple of days had passed, the Viscount and Yasmin were welcoming Queen Emin but they were completely ignorant of the fact that they were about to be very very surprised. When Queen Emin entered, she wasn't alone and on top of that, the two people with her were none other than Laka and Aix. The Viscount greeted them as well and he turned to Aix and told him that he had been looking for him all this time and that he was unsure of the fact that he was bothering Queen Emin. Aix wasn't talking back to him and the Viscount thought that Aix had come to accept his request and he told him that for all the work he did, he would be paid with three gold coins. Aix had confirmed his doubts and confirmed that the person who had put him and all of his friends into trouble again was none other than the Viscount Redlich and he proclaimed that he had come to his mansion only to tell him off once and for all. Aix shouted out that he would never ever work for him. That angered the Viscount and he started shouting back at Aix and he said that he was going to lock him up for refusing to work for him and for making him look bad in front of Queen Emin. But just as he started saying all sorts of bad things to Aix, the Queen had something to tell him as well. She told the Viscount that Aix was known as a great craftsman in her country and that she wouldn't accept such behavior towards him and the Viscount was at a loss for words. He couldn't believe that the queen was on Aix's side and Yesme now intervened. He wanted to request something from the queen herself and she told him to say his wishes out loud. He offered the queen one bottle of a 50 year old wine called the Legend Fairy. The Viscount Redlich said that that was his private wine collection but Yesme assured him that they should try to win over the queen to their side. Queen Emin was interested into the wine collection so she decided to stay and see what they had to offer. Emin said goodbye to Aix and Laka and invited them to visit her country whenever they wanted. Before they left, the Viscount turned and he gave Aix a despicable look. He was angry that his precious wine collection wasn't really private anymore and he proclaimed that he was happy he didn't get the job after all. Aix told the Viscount that it wasn't his doing that Aix didn't get the job but rather it it was he that turned him down once again. Lucky Bear joked with Aix and told him that he looked like a princess that was in dire need of help but Laka corrected him and said that Aix stood proudly like a prince. Laka reached out her hand and told Aix to escort her home. Aix took her by the hand and smiled and while they walked back to Laka's workshop she kept looking at him and it was clear that there was something on her mind that she wanted to share with him. They finally arrived at her place and she thanked him but Aix said that it's should be him that should be thanking her because he had lots of fun going out with her. Laka cast her eyes downwards as she was so ashamed to look Aix in the eyes while speaking her thoughts out loud. She thought to herself how she had a great time with Aix these past couple of days and how she would love to stay with him. She knew that there would never be a good time to speak out about her feelings and she finally said that she loved Aix. She couldn't hear anything else in the rustling of the wind and she continued by saying how she didn't want anyone else to have access to Aix. Laka thought to herself that Aix must have felt the same after hearing her words but as the silence was too long she finally opened her eyes and was completely surprised with what she saw in front of herself. Aix was nowhere to be seen and only Lucky Bear was there. He told Laka that as soon as Aix had finished escorting Laka to her workshop, he turned around and started running very fast. Laka felt really embarrassed and told Lucky Bear to forget everything that he had just heard her say. Lucky Bear said that he wouldn't say a word to anyone but he was still interested in the reason behind Aix's sudden decision. In the meantime, our protagonist was running back to his house as fast as he could and the only thing that was going through his mind was getting some sleep on his precious slime pillows. My bro is gonna sleep on replica of Opai tonight and he could have done it on real life organic things. Now on his way back home as Aix ran by some men on the streets he overheard them talking about how they needed to catch him as they would be rewarded with a gold coin. Aix was disheartened to hear that and he thought that the Viscount was behind that as well or that these men haven't been notified that Aix had already talked with the Viscount. Aix thought to himself that because the men hadn't noticed him he could slip by and run back to the inn but once he got there he was ambushed and caught. 
two men captured him and they told him that they had orders from the Viscount to capture him and bring him to the mansion. Ix tried to explain that he had just talked with the Viscount Redlich, but the men couldn't decide whether that was true or not, so they asked him to follow them or else they would have to take him by force. Ray opened the door and she welcomed Ix back home. She also told the guards that Ix had never done anything wrong and Ix added how the Viscount wanted him to work for him and he kept on refusing and that's why he told people to capture him. That made the men think as they believed Aix when he said that he didn't do any particular crime and they even thought that Aix looked harmless. Our protagonist thought to himself that there was finally someone that understood him and he was about to go inside but the men told him that the only way they could prove he was innocent was for him to follow them and that's why they couldn't let him go. Aix tried to resist and the men told him that if he continued to act like that that he would look even more suspicious and while they struggled something had slipped out of Aix's cloak. One of the men crouched down to inspect the item that fell out of his cloak and when he picked it up he saw the metal of a great craftsman. Aix told him to give it back as that was a gift from Queen Emin and when the men inspected it a bit more thoroughly they saw Aix's name on it and they understood that it was the real deal and they immediately bowed down in front of him. They said how they believed everything he had said and they gave him back his medal. Our protagonist thought to himself how the medal Emin gave him saved him and he was very grateful for that. Aix asked them once again to check whether it would be okay if he went into his room and they said that he was free to do what ever he wanted. He was greeted by Ray and Nitra and Nitra was showing him a better way to escape through the window but Aix wasn't interested in that as that wouldn't be necessary in the near future. Aix hurried over to his bed and he was delighted when he saw his slime pillows. He immediately jumped on his bed and he fell asleep and Ray and Nitra decided that they wouldn't bother him until he gets some good rest. And in the meantime, back at the Viscount's mansion, Viscount Redlich was having negotiations with Queen Emin. They were talking about the Queen replacing Aix in making the cooling tubes, but the Queen couldn't have done it like Aix without any magic stones and she needed 120 of them just for one season. The Viscount thought that that was too much and that the Queen was trying to make money on him and his idea. The Viscount thought of something else and it was the same concept as Aix's cooling tube except that his would be be a heating tube to be used during the winter. The queen thought that, that was rather stupid and that no one would use it and she thought that Aix's invention made much more sense. The Viscount continued by saying how he was the one that invented the cooling tube and he added how the princess loved it as well so that's why he asked for a discount on the heating tube deal. The Viscount went on to try and close the deal for the 30 tubes that he had already promised to make and the queen told him to wait. The Viscount couldn't stop himself from his daydreams and he went on about the deal like it was already a thing of the past and he even said that he would pay for the 120 magic stones to rent one example but in the future he wanted to pay one magic stone for all the other copies. Queen Emin shouted at him to stop because there was something he had to hear as that would change his opinion completely. The Queen told him that the number of 120 magic stones was the price for just one tube and if she were to make 30 of them she would need 3k and 600 of them. After hearing that the Viscount almost had a stroke. He couldn't believe that was true and the thoughts of him going bankrupt were racing through his head and yes men had to calm him down. Meanwhile Aix woke up in his bed and he was feeling rather energized. Meaning that his hollow was right all the time because slime pillows were great. He was immediately greeted by Ray and Nitra and seeing them made Aix remember Uracle and he asked them whether or not he tried to harm them in any way. Ray was surprised that Aix knew him and she added how he was of great help to her while she was in the ghetto. That made Aix think that Uracle wasn't actually that bad of a guy and while he was thinking he heard Nitra's stomach growling so he decided that he would take the girls to get some skewers. They went to a local skewer stand and Nitra was eating them like crazy. She was eating them so fast that Aix had to remind her that he wasn't going to eat any so she could slow down. My girl was eating 
as if there is no tomorrow. Higgs thought to himself how his eating habits have also improved, but he had a long way to go to be able to eat like Nitra. He also overheard some people talking about the demon forest and how it was swarming with monsters and Higgs immediately remembered that his magic barrier might have worn off, but he forcefully shook his head as to distract himself from thinking about work. Ray called out to him and she wanted to thank him for letting them sleep in his room and Nitra thanked him for the skewers. Aix asked them whether there were any news about their house and Ray said that they needed to wait for a vacant house until they could move in and our protagonist said that they could stay in his room as much as they needed and that he would only rent another one at the inn but Ray protested. She shouted out how he had helped them enough already and Aix explained how he couldn't let them go out on the streets. That made Ray think that Aix didn't want to share his room with them and Aix reassured her that that wasn't the case and they started their walk back to the inn. On the way back Ray thought of ways she could make herself useful to Aix and once they got home she quickly jumped into the bed and once she got settled she propped her head from beneath the blanket and told Aix that she would keep him warm in return for his generosity. Ray told Nitra to come to bed as well as that would make it even warmer but Aix wasn't interested in her idea. Instead he sat on the edge of the bed and took an instructional book about magic and he started reading out loud. Aix read a couple of chapters about magic to Ray and Nitra and even though his reading wasn't exceptional, that was more than enough for Ray and Nitra to fall asleep. Once they were sleeping steadily, Aix closed the book and he remembered how his master did the same thing with him and that always worked. Aix stood up, left the room and closed the door behind him. He went down to the reception and was greeted by the innkeeper. He was actually the person Aix was looking for and our protagonist asked him to rent out another room room if that was possible. Even though the inn was full, there was only room in the attic and Aix said that that would be perfect for his needs and he took the key for the attic from the innkeeper. Aix climbed up and he entered the attic but the place was dirty as no one had lived there in a long time. He was actually the last resident there and the attic was a great room because it was a lot cheaper than the other rooms and that's exactly why Aix had used it before. The first thing he did was to use his house clean spell and he cleaned the entire attic in a matter of seconds. He crashed on the bed and he thought to himself how the book he just read to Ray and Nitra didn't really have some important information when it came to using and casting magic and he was also glad that Ray and Nitra were already asleep so they won't remember all of the details he told them about. Aix closed his eyes and went to sleep. His life would become totally different from the next morning and as he went to sleep, a shooting star had fell but Aix was already asleep. And the very next morning he woke up and when he came to his senses, the first thing that came to his mind was that he was spending money on renting two rooms and instead he could just buy himself a house. That was the thing he wanted to do and together with Ray and Nitra he went to one real estate agency. Aik said that he won the lottery and that he wanted to buy a house for himself. He explained how adventurers usually didn't buy houses until they made lots and lots of gold and as he wanted a house for himself, he thought he would use the money that Queen Emin gave him and he told the receptionist that his budget was 5 gold coins. When the receptionist heard his budget, she wasn't very delighted and she said that Aik could only afford houses that were in a bad condition but that didn't matter to him and he told the receptionist that he was fine with whatever, thinking to himself that he could use his magic to make any house better in a matter of seconds. The receptionist continued to show him all the houses that they listed for that price and the first one on the list was the cliff house. That was the closest one to the agency and from the outside everything looked kinda nice but on the inside the house was surprising to say the least. The walls had large chunks of rocks sticking out and the receptionist said that the house was especially designed by a beast kin and it resembled a cliff. The design was like that so that it could incorporate exercise into everyday life. On top of all that, the thing that Aix disliked the most was the fact that the bedroom was on the third floor and he would have to climb if he wanted to go to bed even if he was dead tired. 
That's why they exited the house, and even though Nightsha might have loved that one, Aix told the receptionist to show them another property, and by any chance, one that was designed for humans. The receptionist told Aix that the next house on the list was located in the slums, and it was actually in a very good condition considering his price range. But once they got there, the receptionist told Aix that the main feature of that house was that it lacked a roof, but Aix could clearly see that the house was in ruins and that the walls were charred. While they were walking, Nitra sensed something with her great sense of danger and she quickly reacted to catch something that was thrown at Aix from behind. Aix turned around and saw that Nitra had caught a rock with her bare hands and he thanked her for saving him. It was a group of kids that threw it as they wanted to make them go away as the now abandoned house was their playground. On top of that, Ray also mentioned that that house was actually the house they used to live in and Aix realized why the walls were charred. Aix thought to himself that if he rebuilt the roof, it wouldn't be a problem for them to live there, but those kids could be a pain to deal with. Our protagonist kindly asked the receptionist to show them another house if there were any other houses on the list, and the receptionist told him that there was another house, but it was a little bit over his price range, but the real estate agency could offer him a loan, and then they would be able to afford it. Be it as it may, Aix decided that he wanted to take a look at the house, and once they got there, Aix thought that the house looked rather decent. The receptionist also told him that it had three separate bedrooms, a living room and a kitchen, and on top of all that, the local market was also nearby, and Aix thought to himself that he could make the place their home if he used his magic. But he couldn't decide because of the loan thing, and the receptionist tried to bribe him by offering him candy. She told him to listen to his heart, but Aix's heart was actually ruled by his hollow, and that meant that he had to listen to him. The hollow told Aix that he would really love some of that candy and Aix gladly ate some and he told the receptionist that they won't be taking the house thinking that his hollow wouldn't want it. But he told him that he would love if Aix bought the house and Aix looked like a fool for changing his opinion in the matter of seconds but the receptionist was delighted and invited him back to the agency so they could sign the papers. Once they returned back to the agency, there was someone waiting for them there. It was Lala and she referred to Aix as the great magician. Aix recognized her and he waved at her, but the receptionist was out of her mind because she knew that that girl was actually the third princess of the kingdom. Aix was so ashamed because he thought that Lala was just some rich girl that pretended to be the princess and he never actually thought that she was the princess. Lala said that she ran an investigation about his time at the guild and she had found out that they had been mistreating him from the start and so she came to apologize and she even bowed down her head. Everyone in the room was surprised by that and the great Chamberlain told her that she was a part of the royal family and that they shouldn't bow to anyone but Lala told him to stay back. Aix shared his opinion with the butler and he told Lala that even though he was dead tired while he was working for the guild but since that was all in the past now it didn't matter. But Aix was grateful to her that she had gotten angry at the guild for his sake and now he had a dilemma. He didn't know whether he would refer to Lala as the princess or as his friend and Lala ran to hold his hand and she told him that they were friends and that he should call her only as her friend. Lala told her grandpa that she wanted to convey the message to Aix, that was the main reason they came to the agency. She told him that the kingdom wanted to buy Aix a house because that gesture would be of great help to the kingdom when it came to keeping their honor. Aix was a bit shy but he told them that he would be satisfied with a cheap house as long as it was spacious enough because he would live there with Ray and Nitra. Lala was happy they could help and her grandpa told Aix that there was a perfect house for them and they would give it to Aix for one gold coin. Aix thought to himself that he could have asked for a house that wasn't in a poor condition but now it was too late as Lala told him that a carriage had been waiting for them to take them to see the house. When they came to the place, Aix was speechless when Lala showed them the house. It wasn't a house actually. It was more like a huge mansion and nothing about it seemed stigmatized. After they got settled in, my dog started barking. No, there was something Ray wanted to ask from Aix. She begged him to let her work there as a real maid because she didn't want to be a normal resident. Aix had to think about that for a while and he realized that it would be maybe easier 
to her to stay in such a big mansion if she was occupied with some work. And that's why he asked her to work for him without being arrogant and Ray was delighted at his proposal. When that was settled, Ace gave Ray a couple of gold coins to buy all the food and consumables they needed and he gave her enough money that would cover them for a couple of years. Ray was so shocked as that was the first time that she had ever seen a gold coin before, let alone held one, and while Aix wondered how much he should pay her, she told him that she couldn't possibly accept the salary from him as he had already done way too much for her and Nitra. Aix knew that it would be pointless to try and get her to accept the salary, so he told her to tell him if there was ever anything she needed, even though he knew that she would never say something like that because she was too modest and shy for that. While they talked, Nitra and Aix's hollow had wandered off somewhere and Aix could hear their voices but he didn't know where they were. So they decided to follow the voices and found the two of them in the kitchen. Our protagonist immediately noticed the water jug that was already in place and the immortal fires were already lit and there were house fairies flying around. Aix knew that that must have been his hollow's work and when the hollow saw Aix, he tippy-toed towards him and with his squeaky little voice asked his master to praise him for his work. Ace got on his knees and commended him on a job well done which made the little Hollow very happy. On top of that, when Ray congratulated him, the Hollow was out of his mind from the amount of happiness he felt, but Ace hoped that his illusion wouldn't get any funny ideas after being praised so much. Wink wink. <laughs> after that, Ace told everyone that they should start taking all of their stuff inside. Illusion wanted to come as well but Aix told him that it was probably too soon to let him roam around the town on his own so Illusion jumped inside Aix. The first thing that Aix remembered they needed were blankets and he asked Ray and Nitra whether or not they knew a place that sold some good blankets and Nitra and Ray said that they would take him there. Ray and Nitra led the way and after a short walk they all entered a shop that had all sorts of things, from carpets to blankets. They were greeted by the seller and he told Aix that he could actually try and check all of the pillows and blankets so he could see which ones he liked and Aix was determined to use that option to its full last potential. The first blanket that he tried felt so nice and cozy that Aix could imagine himself hugging a sheep when he closed his eyes. He immediately wanted to buy that one but Ray saw that the blanket was a branded one which made it extra expensive so she told Aix that maybe they should first try out all of them and only then decide. After all getting the blankets and taking care of them being clean was the maid's job so Aix decided to listen to her. They tried all of them and in the end they chose some of the blankets and bought them. Nitra was happy that she could help by carrying the blankets back to the mansion and Aix thanked Ray for letting him know that there were some extra cheaper blankets that were also nice and soft. Once they had gotten home, Aix wanted to get some sleep but just then Illusion came out and he wanted to play. Aix told him that he was too tired and Illusion said that he would play all by himself if that was the case. While everyone was sleeping, Illusion went through the house and he used his magic to improve everything that needed a splash of his magic. He lit the lights, made the freezing rooms usable, filled the water jugs and when the others woke up they were delighted to see that everything was in top condition. Illusion even took down all of the pictures and cast protection magic on them and instead of lifting them he used levitation magic to put them back on the wall. Later that night Nitra woke up Ray from her sleep as there was something she wanted to show her. Nitra Nitra led her sister into a room that was full of picture frames that were floating in mid-air. Ray was shocked with that sight but Nitra hopped on one of the pictures and she pulled Ray by the hand as well. They went flying on the pictures all around the house and Nitra was enjoying every second of it. Ray was hesitant at first but the feeling was too good to pass on all the fun so she let herself enjoy the ride as well. After a while, the pictures came to a stop and the girls came upon Illusion. They realized that it was probably his magic that made all of that possible, so Nitro gave him a treat which he loved. Ray remembered that they should actually do the same with Aix and she took out an apple and cut it. They entered Aix's room and woke him up from his sleep and brought him breakfast. Aix was really happy with the apple and Ray said that Nitro picked it out. 
Aix was really grateful to both of them and he told Rey that she did an exceptional job as a maid. The girls also said that Illusion made the house awesome with its magic and Aix was happy with that as well. And in the meantime Laka was thinking about Aix in her bedroom while drinking tea all by herself but it seemed that her plush bunny had a certain idea. And that's all for today's video bros, thank you so much for watching. These are actually all the chapters of the manga that are currently out recapped in this one video here i actually really really enjoyed it it's an interesting mix between slice of life and adventure but yeah that's all for now thank you so much for watching the entire video and for your amazing support always stay awesome like these bros and peace